more responsible in many ways, and his brother and I did not need to constantly ask him to perform his duties. When Lodvia returned with the carcasses of some of the animals they had slaughtered at the ships, he was informed of the plan. As the meat began to cook, he sat with us while Jarl Swain ensured that the others knew what they were about. I do not like this, Sven Saxon sword. I do not mind facing a Saxon sword to sword, but here we have to watch our feet lest we are speared by a shit-covered stake and then climb a ladder while men are dropping stones on our heads. Why climb the ladders at all? Hawk laughed. And how else do we enter the burr? Fly? I can do so, but the rest of you... That made us all smile, but I shook my head. I have looked at the walls. See how they have used Roman walls for the base? Lodvia nodded. Aye, and we all know how well the Romans built. It is almost a thousand years since they did so. Look closely. That is moss growing in the mortar. I see ivy, too. Hawk frowned. And? Lodvia grinned. I see what you mean, Sven. It means that the mortar is old and weak. We dig out the mortar and pull out the stones. So long as we are protected from the falling stones, it would be easier than using axes. And without a support, then the wooden palisades would be easier to bring down. Swain One-Eye said, Or oh, we could use fire. Once we have a stone removed, we light a fire and let that do our work for us. By the time Jarl Swain's skull-taker had returned, we had improved our plan, and Lodvia presented it to him. He beamed. Well done, Lodvia. Twas not me, Swain. It was the boy I trained. His mind is as sharp as his father's was. Well done, foster son. Your father would be proud of you. We will still use ladders, for that will keep those on the walls occupied. Sven, as this was your idea... You choose the men you will use. I had thought of this, too. We will need every mailed warrior on the ladders. I will use Faramir, Dreng, Snorri, Siggy, and the other young warriors. They have good shields, and that is all that is needed. Amongst the tools we had taken from Pinho were some hammers and some chisels. I chose the best of each and then went to see the eight warriors I had selected. I presented it as an opportunity rather than an order. The Jarl would have all those without mail using slings and bows on the morrow. I saw their faces fall. You eight, if you choose, can come with me and protect my body with your shields. I intend to bring down the walls of Exeter. They all shouted their agreement, and then Snorri asked, How will you do that? Magic? Faramir said, or will you use the oath sword? Oath sword will be there, but I shall use hammer and chisel. Drang, you will need to bring fire in a pot and snorry kindling. We shall need Thor's help when we do this. That evening, while we ate, I said to the Jarl, Foster father, I cannot watch Canute while I light the fires. Canute had gone to fetch water to clean our bowls and was not present. I know. I will put the boy with the other slingers. Bergil the brawny managed to hurt his ankle today, and I will leave him to command the others. He is not happy about having to remain here, and he will ensure that the princeling does not move. He was right, and neither Canute nor Bergil were happy about their task. We were all prepared before dawn. We had eaten well and were as prepared as we could be. It felt strange to have a hammer and a chisel as my weapons of choice, and I knew that once we were within two hundred paces of the walls then a host of missiles would be hurled at us. Lodvir had reminded us that the Saxons sometimes used darts. My young warriors would all carry their shields, whilst mine would be across my back. I had already kissed the hilt of Oathsword and asked the Allfather to watch over me. I prayed that while the Norns had spun a strange future for me, that they would not cut the thread so early. Once I reached the walls, then I felt confident that the wall of shields above me would protect me. Dawn had barely broken when the horns sounded five times. The ones attacking from the west, Jarl Sven Hakonason and his Norsemen, would have the advantage of the last hint of knight's cloak to protect them. 
the ones attacking from the east would have the advantage of a new sun in the eyes of the defenders. We had no advantage, for we attacked from the north. The Jarl raised his sword, and our slingers and archers closed to within range of the walls. Some would be wounded, and some would die. I saw that Bergil the Brawny had his shield protecting Canute. I knew the boy would not like that. Following my young warriors, I walked towards the stakes. The stakes would do little to stop us, for they were spaced far enough apart to allow us through, but they would catch the unwary if any did not present their shields to face the enemy. We made the edge of the ditch successfully, although I had heard the arrows and stones slamming into the shields of the young warriors before me. Adel had an arrow wound to his leg, but it had been a glancing blow and would not stop him. We all stopped at the edge. The other mailed warriors had their shields before them. I saw that the stakes were far enough apart to allow us to tread a precarious path through them. The danger would come if we slipped, and I saw that they had used water to make the slope more dangerous. I shouted to my companions, Treat the slope like winter ice. Spread your feet and keep your balance. That was easier said than done, and for the first time I would lose the protective shields. I had to do as I had advised, but faster than they did. Jarl Swain Skulltaker and his Hearthweru led the advance, and that drew arrows and stones to them. I stepped down, and I used my left heel to dig into the soft mud. I found it easier than I had thought. If I had used the flat of my boot, then I might have slipped, but I was in effect making my own steps, and I reached the bottom upright. As a stone clanked off my helmet, I disobeyed my own orders and used my quick feet to dance through the stakes which were covered in human and animal dung. A wound from such a stake could prove to be fatal. When I reached the other slope, I did not stop, but used the hammer and chisel to dig into the bank and to pull myself up. A dart hit my right shoulder, but my cloak, sword belt and mail meant it barely penetrated to my padded undershirt. I reached the wall as Faramir and Eric Redhair put their shields above me. While time was of the essence, I needed to find a weak spot, and I sought the thick strand of ivy which had embedded itself in the mortar. The mortar had been put there by the Romans. I saw the crushed seashells they used and when I pulled the ivy I was rewarded with not only ivy root, but also great chunks of mortar. Some were as thick as my finger. More shields appeared above me and my world darkened. It did not matter, for I could feel where I had to dig. I smashed the hammer against the head of the chisel, and each blow brought out more of the mortar, while it sounded like hailstones as the Saxons dropped stones of increasing size. Once I had done the bottom of the single stone, I began on the sides of the block of masonry. I did not need to make a hole big enough to enter, but it had to have a space for the firewood. It was then that I heard Dreng shout, Oil! They have oil! The boiling oil was dropped onto the shields. I heard Eric cry out as his arm was burned by a splash of boiling oil, but he was a warrior and he endured it. The shields had absorbed most of the damage, but it was a warning for me to hurry. When the last piece of mortar was removed, I said, I am about to pull out the stone. Be ready with the fire and the kindling. We will have to drop back into the ditch, so watch the stakes. They chorused, I, oath sword. It seemed I had a new name, amongst these warriors at least. I saw a crack in the stone I was about to pull, and I took a chance. Placing the chisel end in the crack, I gave an almighty swing, and not only did the stone crack a little more, but a piece the size of my hand fell. It meant I had something to grab, and I pulled. The stone came away, and I hurled it into the ditch. I saw that the palisade had been embedded in the stone, and I could see another stone on the far side. That stone would face the inside of the burr. Kindling and fire even as the kindling was ignited, we were slipping down the slope, and my foot was arrested by the stone I had removed. The Saxons had helped us with the oil, as most of the oil was impregnated in the wood of the palisade, and with a whoosh, a wall of flame leapt into the air. I heard the screams as those who were above us were either burned or jumped out of the way. 
Shielding my eyes from the brightness, I saw that while we had not yet made the fighting platform, the rest of our men were dueling with the defenders. But in front of us, there were no defenders. The fire had taken hold and driven them away. Turning, I cupped my hands and shouted, Bergil, send axes! Aye, Saxon sword. My small band were largely whole. Adel and Eric had wounds, but they could still fight. When the axes come, we will climb again. We will take the wall to the left of the fire. It will be hot work, but the wood will be all the weaker. Shall we be first in Exeter's walls? They roared. Aye, oath sword. I was tempted to draw the magical weapon, but then it came to me. I might still need my hammer and chisel. Gandalfa brought the first axe, and three boys brought the others. Gandalfa grinned. I am a better axeman than an archer. We ascended the slope. The smoke and the flames made it a much easier journey the second time, and as the four with axes hacked at the wall closest to the flames, I found another ivy-covered stone. I had a better idea of what to do this time, and I found the crack before all the mortar was removed. As I pulled it out, I heard a creak from above. Gandalfer, fetch your axe. I pointed to the base of the wooden palisade and the stone. Strike the wood and then see if you can push the stone out. I laid down my hammer and chisel as I stepped back, and the young warrior in three blows smashed through the wooden stake. The other wood was weakened already and there was an alarming crack. I heard a scream as a defender fell to his death, and then, as the internal stone was removed, the air rushed in and fanned the flames. The wall of fire seemed to spread quicker than a cloud could move. I saw some of our warriors begin to descend the ladders before the inferno engulfed them too. Our other axes had made a gap, and the wind took the flames to one side. I saw that there was almost a gap, and drawing my two swords climbed to the top of the bank, and putting my shoulder to the weakened and blackened wood, smashed my way into the burr. I felt the heat, and my beard and hair were singed, but as I stepped into the burr I heard the screams and shouts of shock. Four Saxons ran at me. None were mailed, but each had a sword and a small round shield. I did that which they did not expect. I ran at them, and used both swords at the same time. While Oath Sword found a bare neck, my other sword deflected a blade that was aimed at me. I felt a Saxon sword smash across my back as I passed the first two surprised defenders. My shield and mail did their job, and I heard a scream from one as Gandalf's axe ended his life. I blocked another sword and rammed the sharpened tip of Oath Sword up under the jaw of the Saxon. I had been foolish enough and taken all the risks necessary. Shields! I had trained the young men and they formed a shield wall on me. Behind me, I heard Bergil the brawny ordering the charge as he led the rest of our men through the gap we had created. Their walls were breached, the wolves were in the sheepfold and the end was inevitable. This was a strong burr with a good garrison, strengthened with Normans under the command of Count Hugh, the Frenchman, but they had expected their walls to do what they had done the last time we had come and keep us at bay. They had thought to make us bleed upon them, until the nearest two burrs, Bridport and Lidport, could send warriors to their aid. They had failed. Jarl Swain joined us, and he was beaming. Well done, my foster son. The new blood of Ayrhorn is strong. Now, let us advance through the burr to the other gate. King Swain will be anxious to take the riches of this place. He waved his sword to Gandalfer and the others. This is work for mailed men. Take what treasures you can and secure this wall. I could see that they were disappointed and wished to come with us, but they obeyed. Ay, Jarl. Raising their weapons, they saluted me. Oath sword! As they trooped off, Swain One Eye said, Another name? You are like our clan and hard to pin down. We formed a wedge and headed down through the straight streets of Exeter. 
designed to allow warriors to rush from one part of the burg to another. They were now a dagger to the heart of the stronghold. We had moved just fifty paces when Count Hugh and his forty Normans came to face us. We outnumbered them, for Lodvir and his men had joined ours. But they were a formidable foe, for they were alike enough to us to make the outcome questionable. Like us, they had burnies, but they all wore the helmet with a nasal. Ours were less uniform. Some of the Normans had spears, but most had swords or axes. They made a shield wall, and both bands of warriors advanced towards each other. We headed for the Norman count, who had scale armour and a domed helmet. His shield was that of a horseman, and covered his left side. There was not enough room for a heavy charge, and we met at a fast walk. I had no shield, and the Norman who faced me thought to take advantage, and he rammed his shield towards my face in an effort to distract me while he brought his sword from on high. I fooled him by ignoring the shield, and while my second sword blocked his swinging sword, Oathsword darted out to slide into his left orb. Such a wound makes a man scream, not because he is less of a man, but simply because of the pain. It was curtailed when Oathsword came out of the back of his skull, showering the next Norman with blood, bone, and brains. The shield did not hurt me, for by the time it struck, the strength had gone from the blow. The street was only wide enough for twenty-odd men, and there was a huge press as men sought to bring a weapon to bear when there was no room to swing. Warriors used heads and helmets to butt, and knees to drive up under burnies into unprotected groins. Even so, it might have been a bloody stalemate had not Jarl Sven Harkonnesen brought his warband to attack the side and rear of the Normans through the street which ran east to west. With Vikings on two sides, the Normans died. None asked for quarter, and all died well, but die they did. Count Hugh lasted just four strokes longer than the man I had first slain, his lieutenant. It was afternoon by the time the last defender was slain, for some hid in houses trying to ambush us as we cleared them. It ensured that none were left alive, and the next day, When the treasury, churches and granaries had been emptied, and the dead stripped of everything of value, we burned the town to the ground. By the following morning there was no sign that there had ever been a burr at Exeter, for the only remains were the foundations of the old Roman fort, and Carl Three Fingers was satisfied. Chapter 9 The king left us to mop up the villages and towns within twenty miles of the ruined burgh. We loaded our drecker first, and then the king took his warriors to rob the abbeys, monasteries, and nunneries which the burgh had protected. His Christianity was conveniently forgotten. The best slaves had already been taken, and so we just took animals. The ram I had chosen the last time had proved to be popular with farmers, and we found another one to take home. We also gathered eight ewes. If we had to, we could use them for food, but in a perfect world they would be added to our flocks. We spent three weeks taking all that there was to take, and then King Swain ordered the fleet back to White. The army would not board the ships. Instead, we would march east, plundering as we went. Raiding parties had headed as far west as Omwalam, and we had many ponies and horses. Those who had been wounded or considered too old were sent on the ships to join the warriors who guarded what would become our camp. As we said, when we were told, this was a bold move. From Exeter to Wintoncester was more than a hundred miles. There were at least five large burrs between us and the capital of Wessex. The Saxons would have time and opportunity to gather a huge army to face us. We had not lost as many men in the taking of Exeter, But we had lost men, and with those now aboard the ships heading to White we were a pared-down army. But everyone seemed confident. I knew why. The enemy had a weak king. The fleet sailed, but we stayed in camp for the last feast. The fleet's movement would confuse the Saxons. Had we left? 
We had devastated the land close to Exeter, and not a Saxon remained there who was alive. It was different at the mouth of the Ex and the Tain. Word would be sent to the east and the king that the Viking ships had left. King Swain was in an ebullient mood when he addressed us. I knew that there were some Saxon advisers. I later discovered these had served his brother-in-law, Palig, and defected to King Swain after the massacre. They brought detailed knowledge not only of the land, but the men who might face us. Warriors, you may wonder why I have sent our wave stallions to white. I will tell you. We will ride stallions ourselves, albeit the four-legged kind, and we shall head east. We will take all in our path. The nunnery at Wilton is but newly built and filled with treasure, and that shall be ours. Sarum has a fine cathedral and is a rich city. That, too, will fall. Now I know that some of you will wonder what the Saxons will be doing while we are relieving them of their treasure. The answer is simple. They will gather every warrior that they can and face us in the field. They will outnumber us, but as Carl Three Fingers will tell you, that does not guarantee that they will win. The men who face us will be led by Erledman Elric, and a more spineless creature does not exist. If he does face us, then I fear him not, and would happily send Canute and Harold, young though they are, to do battle with him. That brought laughter and cheers. The two boys were popular, for neither had shirked in the assault. The king reveled in the cheers and went on. And what of the driveller, King Ethelred? I have it on good authority that he will squat like a toad behind London Wick's walls where the rabble there will support him. He shook his head. He can squat all he likes. Sven Saxon's sword has shown us that a burr can be taken by brave men who are resourceful and well-led. That brought a cheer louder than the earlier one, and the ghost of a frown flickered over the king's face. He dismissed the thought with another smile and more bravado. Tomorrow we head east and take Yeovil. We will be swift and strike so quickly that they will have no idea where we will strike next. I want our path to Wintoncester, marked with the bodies of Saxon warriors and the burned and blackened remains of their towns. This king thought to kill our people. He will now pay the price. The smile returned as the greatest cheer thus far rent the air. We left in the middle of the night, aided ironically by the Saxon Herapath, which had been designed to move the Saxon army quickly around. Yeovil was not a burr, and our ponies and horses took us there to arrive a couple of hours after dawn. We had not raided as far east as this, and the word must have spread that the Viking fleet had gone. The gates of the town walls were open, and we were inside them before they even had time to react to the warband which materialised with the sun. Perhaps they had not expected us to ride. They fled, leaving all behind. Those who were at the fore, Carl Three Fingers men, had warriors to fight. But by the time the rest of us reached the town, there were no more to fight. We took everything that there was to be had. We had taken the town so quickly that we even captured more horses, and for the next week King Swain ravaged and raided the land which lay close to the town. With many ponies and horses, that was a distance of fifteen to twenty miles. We lost not a man, and so much treasure that I wondered how we would be able to carry it to our ships waiting along the coast for us. Canute showed his hard side as we raided the small town of Glestingjaburg. There was a hill with a tower, but our attack was so swift that the Jarl and ten of his best warriors reached it and took it before it could be manned. We burned it and then headed back to the town where the rest of our warband was busily taking all that there was to take. When I let families go, some of them with youths of fourteen or so, he questioned my judgment. Sven Saxon sword, they will become warriors one day. Why not kill them now and then there will be fewer enemies in the future? I did not tell him of the promise I had made Mary, but I tried to give him a reason which I hoped might appeal to his Christianity although I was coming to realise that his family's adherence to the White Christ 
was merely a way of gaining credibility. You could be right, but think on this. They might not. They might become merchants, farmers, or priests. They bring us more profit, and if the ones I spare do become warriors, do you think they will have any confidence when they face us again? They will be more likely to run. Do not be so eager to spill blood, for there is a time and place for such things. I was not convinced that he believed my arguments, but I felt honour bound to make him as good a man as I could. We heard, perhaps through spies once more, that the Saxons under Elric were heading for us, and that they had an army which outnumbered ours. We headed east to meet them. We would not fight from horseback, but the army which would meet them would not be as tired as they were, for we had ridden whilst they had marched. We tethered our animals and left some men and the boys to guard the treasure we had taken. Of course, every warrior had a purse on his belt, hidden beneath, if he wore it, his mail. That way none would leave a war poorer. If we were alive when we stopped fighting, we would have coins. The two exceptions were Harald and his brother Knut. We faced the Saxons over open fields, and as usual, the Saxons spent some hours exhorting their god to smite us. When darkness fell, they had still to attack. Many of us wanted to initiate a night attack, but King Falkbeard assured us that it would not be necessary. And sure enough, by noon the next day, the army had headed east, unwilling to fight us. Knut was particularly disappointed, and he had envisaged a real battle with shield walls and heroic deeds. We rode quickly to Wilton, where we surprised the nuns at the nunnery. It was indeed rich, as was the village which had grown around it. The nuns were made thralls, and both the dwellings and the nunnery were burned to the ground. Such was the speed of our attack that Sarum, which had an old ring defence and earthworks, was simply abandoned, and the people there fled to Winchester. We burned the town after taking all that there was to take. To Knut's great disappointment, that was our last action, and we headed back to our fleet. The reason was simple. We could not carry any more. Our ships would be heavily laden on the way home. There would be no half-empty vessels. We marched south without any hindrance whatsoever. I believe we could have stayed there and spent the winter feeding from our enemies. I did not want to, and I for one was glad when the fleet set sail at the end of a very successful campaign season to head back to Denmark. King Ethelred had been taught a lesson, and King Swain now knew that we had the beating of the Saxons. The voyage home was as slow as ever. Laden ships whose decks were covered in animals and thralls meant that we could use fewer rowers and were more reliant on the wind. The winds were usually in our favour at that time of the year, and had been one of the reasons for our return. As Hathweru, we were spared any rowing, and the rest of the crew kept men at the oars during the daylight hours, and once King Swain had left us to head north, at night too. We landed at Ribe, and that was because we had sprung a strake. Sea Serpent was old, the oldest in our fleet, and we would not take her to war again. We left her at Bolly's shipyard, and we walked back to Eagerhon. A few of the younger warriors and ship's boys ran the whole way to warn the town that we were coming. We had been a village, but now we were a town. The wailing thralls and the awkwardly-minded animals slowed us, and it was almost dark by the time we reached our home. The thralls were put in the thrall hall without food as punishment for the noise they had made. I just went directly to my hall. Gandalfer and Faramir happily carried my chest of treasure. They each had a suit of mail taken from the dead Saxons and Normans. They were grateful to me, and, had I been able, would have happily been my oath sworn. A hearthweru cannot have oath sworn. I think Canute was a little unhappy that he would be in the Jarl's Hall once more. He still saw me, of course but that was just on the days when I helped to train the young warriors. Canute felt he owed me his life. Just the two of us and Hawk knew of the incident, for I had not been loose with my tongue. 
the secret nature of the event seemed to draw us closer together. We had certainly been closer on the way back across, first Wessex and then the sea, than he had with my cousins. I was impressed with the way he dealt with it. I knew from our conversations that he was more than happy to learn how to be a leader, and Swain Skulltaker was a better model than his father. Canute had seen how Swain had taken the time to speak to all his crew, as well as each of his captains. In contrast, the king spoke only to people to give them orders. His speech to inspire us had been a rarity. Canute would learn while he was at Ayahana, but he missed my friendship. For my part, I was also learning. I was discovering what it was to deal with the young. I had not had younger siblings, and my brothers had not had time to become fathers. Canute was a chance for me to prepare for the time Gunhild and Steyan became children and not babes. The two had changed in the months I had been away. Gunhild could now toddle, and her babbling took the form of words. She spoke both Danish and Saxon, but her Saxon was better. That was Anna's influence. I knew it would be the same with Steyan, and I determined to make his Danish at least as good as his Saxon. I would remedy the bias shown by his mother and his nurse. Mary was just pleased to have me home, although she had been kept busy. Frida had given birth to a son, and he had been named Axel. It was a good choice, and Hawk, who had been born Alf, was happy with the name. His wife had not enjoyed an easy birth, and she rarely left the hall. Agnetha would care for her, but there would be no second child for Hawk for some time. It delayed the departure of Hawk for Ribbe. Mary and I had some time alone, for Anna had taken the children to bed where she would tell them stories. I suspect they were stories from the Bible, for she and Mary often spoke of the stories they had been told, but I did not mind. Stories were stories, and when they were old enough they would hear Svein's sagas. Poor Frida showed me that I have been blessed and a little lucky. We should try for a third child while I am still healthy. That pleased me, and I squeezed my wife's hand. We shall be home for the winter again, and I think that many warriors will be doing as I do. Yet, husband, the land which the younger warriors wish is not there. Gandalfa, who married not long before you left, and his wife have to live on his father's farm. It is not large, and there is no privacy. Bertha, his wife, is with child, and she worries that when it is born next month, then there may be problems with her husband's mother. I knew there was something behind her words, but as usual, discovering what they were was too hard a task for me. And what is it that you wish, my love? Speak plainly. She smiled. We have a thrall hall which is now almost empty. Gandalfa and Bertha could live there. Now that Egbert is a free man and has his own home, there is no one to supervise the thralls. I fear that without supervision they may get up to mischief. I could not see a problem with that so long as Gandalf was happy about it. When I spoke to him the next day I saw that my wife had already mentioned the idea to Bertha, for Gandalf eagerly accepted my offer. He took on the role of thrallmaster happily, and I knew that there would be no mischief. It proved to be the start of a new way of life for the young warriors I had trained envied Gandalfa and his wife. While some who married had fathers whose land was large enough for them to have some portion of it, others did not, and as they married, they asked my permission to live in the thrall hall. I acceded, of course, for my wife was kind. Winter was approaching, and we all knew that King Swain would return to the rich land which had yielded so much treasure that his warriors were finding it hard to spend. Some foolish warriors chose to have helmets inlaid with silver and gold, a nonsense as it added little to the strength of the helmet and yet attracted an enemy. I knew that from the Hercumble. Although there was not a great deal of gold when we had fought the Normans at Exeter, I had seen warriors' eyes widen when they spied it. For us it was a badge of honour and not a measure of our wealth. We spent our coins more wisely, and we went to Ribbe to order a new drecker. It would be named Sea Serpent, for by the time it was launched we would have buried with dignity our old drecker. We had coins to spend, and so it would be larger, nineteen oars aside, and as we wanted it quickly, 
we paid Bolly to employ more men. There were more men in Ribe seeking work, for the town had now blossomed, as had Ayurana. It was not just Axel the Swede who had made his home there. Many Norse merchants had come, and there were even some Northumbrians who had seen the potential for profit. Lodvir surprised us all by taking a wife. She was the widow of a sea captain whose ship had failed to return from a winter crossing to Norway. They had begun to become friends before we had raided, and the absents had thrown themselves into each other's beds. He was to be a father, and the hall now had a woman's touch. The Norns had been spinning, but I was pleased for Lodvir deserved a family. That he would find it strange amused me. I visited Ribe often, either on the business of the Jarl or on Mary's, and I saw him more frequently than I had. It was good, for I missed the warrior who had made me the man I was. When Hawk became Hersia, then Lodvir would live in the hall he had built with his own profits. Our new table had been delivered, and I was instructed by my wife to order two similarly carved chairs for us two. Another expense, but I could afford it. I was also asked to buy fine cloths and fabrics, for she wished to sew a tapestry to hang on the walls. I knew it would have a Christian theme, but that mattered not, for there was increasing pressure from King Swain and his wife to convert to Christianity. It was not yet a command, and I found it hard to reconcile with the way we had enslaved nuns and destroyed churches. It was a political gesture, and in the eyes of our king made us, he thought, less barbaric. I knew the Saxons did not agree with that. Our clan was growing. When my father and his crew had been killed all those years ago, then we had shrunk, but the dead men had left children at home, and now that crop had ripened. With the influx of settlers, we would be able to crew the three Ayahona Drekka easily, as well as supplying more men for the Reba boats. We buried sea serpents on the spring equinox when her replacement arrived. We had taken the mast, oars, and steering board from her. We used the fishing boats to tow her out to the end of the harbour, for she would be used to make a breakwater. Even in death, the Drekka would serve us. She was filled with rocks, and her gunwales were barely above the water. The Jarl and the Hearthweru, along with Thorsten, were the crew who went with her on her final voyage. We had with us a large fowl, for the Jarl would make a bloot to ensure a safe journey for the Drekka. When it was in position, we made the sacrifice, and Thorsten and Sven Skulltaker said farewell. We left the Drekka, and then the fishing boats loaded more sacks of rocks and pebbles on top of her decks, so that the Drekka sank ever lower. Until suddenly, with a flash of bubbles, both sides slipped beneath the waves, and she went to the bottom. The water was not deep, and we could still see her. The bloot had been a good one, and gradually the sea would reclaim her. Worms would eat the wood, and creatures would move into the rocks to make a home. Sands would pile up on the seaward side, and as we added more stones each year, so eventually a stone breakwater would appear. I did not know if I would be there to see it, but I hoped my children would, and I would tell them of what we did. The story was every bit as valuable as Noah and his ark, or Jonah and the whale. We then had two weeks in which to fit out the new Drekka and give her sea trials. There was preparation for my family. Soon I would be away again. The island to the west was still a happy hunting ground for us. As men had died or suffered wounds which meant they could no longer go to war, so the newer warriors moved up the Drekka closer to the steering board. It was seen as a place of honour. The new Drekka could accommodate more men, and so the first day of the sea trials was spent in the harbour with Thorsten balancing the weight of the warriors with their experience. Knut was older, too. Indeed, Had he been one of the clan, then he might already occupy the oar closest to the prow, for he was now almost a man and shaving. Thorsten used him to race up and down the centre to move men, until, just after the sun had passed its zenith, he was ready for us to row out of the harbour. He would not risk the sail on the first day. The ship's boys would not have to scurry up sheets and risk life and limb on the new yard. Instead, he took the Drekka through its paces. 
It was good for the new warriors to have a much easier time than they might have had if this had been a raid. By the end of the afternoon, he was satisfied. The next day would see us sail to Riba and return. That day would see the sail unfurled and the oars would be pushed to the limit. We would not have shields, and so we were all in for a wetter time. The sail had been made by Agnetha and the women of the clan. The Volvers had woven spells that they had sewn into the design. It was a coiled sea serpent, and the red eyes were two spells which the Volvers had spent many hours spinning. Their hair was incorporated so that when we were at sea they would be there with us. Mary, of course, had had nothing to do with the pagan ritual. She was not the only Christian, but she was the most prominent. The Volvers and the other women accepted that, for they knew that her heart was in the clan. I wore my cape as we took the new drecker to sea. Both the wind and the waves would give us a better test than had we sailed the previous day. We would be close to the coast, but there would be troughs and swells. The wind would be with us when we sailed north, and against us south. It was as though the All-Father had arranged it, for we were able to line the gunwale and see the sea as it flicked from our hull. The wind made us fly, and it was exciting to be the first warriors on a new drecker. I felt honoured, and wondered at those who had first done the same with the original sea serpent. Were they watching from Valhalla? I was at the steering board with the Jarl, Thorsten and Knut. She is well made, Jarl Swain. Let us see how she turns, eh? We were a mile out of the harbour, and as we had already passed the nearest island, with open water before us, he pushed the steering board to larboard. We seemed to spin, and the phrase wave stallion came to mind. It was like a good horse that responded to a rider's heels. Some of the warriors were almost caught out by the move, and I heard laughter as they were hauled back aboard. It was a warning that we were aboard a ship, and a warship at that. She was more like a sea creature. The waddling Nars were safer and slower, while we were on a dangerous creature. Handled badly, then disaster could ensue. Lodvir had seen our approach, and he awaited us on the quay. A fine drecker. I envy you. Bolly makes good ships, but he told me that he was lucky to find a single tree to make the keel. It is a good sign. Aye, and when we return to Ayahonna this afternoon, we shall see what we can do with oars. The crew did well yesterday, and I hope that this morning has shown them what we can do. It went better than we could possibly have hoped, and although the new warriors had red hands at the end, none wished to go ashore. It was as though we were all desperate to go raiding, just so that we could see what our drecker could do on the open ocean. We knew that we would be raiding, and so, after the sea trials, Jarl Swain asked for the crew to give another afternoon to train for war. We Hearthweru had trained young warriors, but it had been some time since we had trained as a clan. With a larger and newer crew it would be needed, and so we practised. For Canute, this was something new. He had seen his father's warriors, but they had just practised their fighting skills and not their fighting formation. We used the shield wall first, as that was the most basic of our formations, and the one we used the most. Using four boys to stand in for us, Swain and I chivied and pushed the newer warriors into position. We were training, and so we did not wear mail, but we knew which warriors owned mail, and our front rank was determined by those men. We had some younger warriors who also had mail, and we put the biggest of those behind the boys who represented us. The last rank was given the most attention of all. We alternated those who had been to war with those who had not. Once Jarl Swain was happy with the formation, we showed the newer ones how to press their shields into the backs of those before them. Then the boys left, and we took our place. We used our clan chant to get the beat. Every warrior knew it, having heard it from when they were boys. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend, our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake, the serpent comes your gold to take. 
We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and a black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend, our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird in the snake? The serpent comes your gold to take. Marching with spears held over our shields was a hard skill, but after half an hour we had managed it. It was then that Jarl Swain revealed a new formation. I had expected us to go into a wedge, but Swain's skull-taker realised that we had more men, and, more importantly, men who had fought in a sea battle as well as two major battles against Saxons. We used the boar's snout formation, and, although I did not know it before, I learned that I was to be moved from the Jarl's right shoulder. The Jarl addressed us all, but looked at me. We will use two wedges. I will lead one, and the warrior you all call Oath Sword, Sven Saxon Sword, will lead the other. Every eye turned to me. Canute, you shall be me. Stand here. And Hawk, stand where Sven usually stands. The warriors who were usually placed behind us were split up. Once there were ten men in the wedge, four at the back, three in front of them, Swain, One-Eye and Hawk behind Canute. Then the Jarl placed a rank of men behind them. Four overlapped them. He addressed us all. I will put the other ranks in place when we have made our second rank. Come, foster son. He took me, eight warriors from the first wedge, and placed me parallel to Canute, who looked quite interested in what was going on. Leif and Lars, you have fought with Sven since his first battle. Stand behind him. That was comforting, for one or the other had always been behind me. Gandalfer, Faramir and Dreng, you have also fought with Sven. Stand behind the brothers. The last four were also from the men I had led at Exeter. Jarl Swain was clever, and knew that the fire we had created that day was not just a literal fire. There was a fire burned in our hearts as shield brothers, and he was using it. Replacing Canute, he had the king's son and the other boys to act as an enemy. With shortened ranks behind us, we began to march. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend, our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend, our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. It was harder than when we had marched as a shield wall, for I had to keep pace with the Jarl and my cousins. However, the advantage of the two wedges, the boar's tusks, was clear. As we neared Canute and the boys, I saw that we would penetrate an enemy line first. With two such wedges, we would tear great holes in an enemy shield wall, and when our line moved up, we would be able to punch a wide hole in an enemy line. We stopped when darkness descended. We had not had a perfect practice. Some men had fallen. But the novelty meant that every warrior was buzzing as he spoke to his shield brother on the way back to the town. I went back with the Jarl, the Hearthweru, and Canute. Jarl, I am pleased with the honour, but it puts you at greater risk, for you now have just two Hearthweru. I saw at Exeter that you, my foster son, are also a leader. Men followed you and Oath Sword. That is too powerful a weapon to keep just for my protection. I know this puts you at greater risk, but both Lodvir and Griatard agree with me. We have spoken of you and your skill. You were chosen to find the sword, and since it has come to the clan we have seen nothing but victory, treasure, glory and growth. You are still and will always be hearth Weru, but now you will draw those enemies who would come to me to you. It is I who will be grateful to you. Perhaps this will give Mary cause to curse me, I know not, but I believe that Oath Sword will protect you, and, as the whole clan knows, you are now the best warrior. We had reached his hall, and I had to make my way back to my own hall. Me? 
Swain One Eye laughed. Cousin, in the last battles we have fought, the first enemy to be killed by the clan was struck by you. At Dean, it was your movement forward that broke the Saxons. Do not be unduly modest. I know that with my one eye I can never be the warrior you are, but even with two eyes I doubt that I would have the natural killing skills which you have. Hawk nodded. My brother is right. There was a time before Svolder when I was jealous of you, but now I see that you cannot be jealous when the choice was made by others. You did not choose this path, Sven. The old father, the Norns, he shrugged. Some higher power made the sword come to you, and at that moment you changed. In your heart, you know it. I would not be you, for you have been noticed, and you could become a plaything of the gods and the Norns. I am happy just to watch my father's back. I have had my single moment of glory, and I would not change it. For you, your life will become a series of such events. With those wise words from Hawk, I headed home. There would be little point in explaining to Mary this new formation and the danger it would bring. She would not understand my words, and all that it would do would be to increase her fear. Instead, when I was greeted by my family, I babbled on about the new Drecker. But inside, my mind was a maelstrom. Chapter 10 Ayahon, 1004 It was spring when we next sailed to war, and this time King Swain had chosen to raid the land of the East Angles, and the most important city on that coast, Northwick. The city had many Vikings living there as well as Angles and Saxons, but they had all chosen to support King Ethelred. They would regret that choice. There were other reasons why the clever Carl Three Fingers had suggested the raid there to the king. It was a shorter voyage. We could simply sail south and west and the English would have no warning. We had not raided there before and they would not be expecting us. But the most important reason was its riches. With more than twenty churches and many warehouses, it was a major port on the east coast. Londonwick and Jorvik each had a long river journey for ships wishing to land their cargoes. Northwick was closer to the coast. Even Jarl Swain agreed with the choice. The flat land in the east suited us and meant that there were few burrs. The many rivers afforded opportunities for us to use our drekker for support. The river Yare was wide enough for our drekker, and we could surprise them by attacking at dawn. We would be sailing with fewer ships, as the Norse would not be with us. They would be raiding Northumbria. Uhtred the Bold ruled Northumbria and had recently defeated the Scots. With their eyes on the north, the Norse thought that they could raid Northumbria and weaken it, for King Swain now clearly had his eyes on the crown of what men now termed England. There was great excitement in Eyrhon as we prepared to meet the fleet, this time off our coast. We had a new ship and many new warriors. Our new formation gave more warriors the chance for glory, and thanks to our successes we had many more mailed men than most other clans. The bird after which the clan was named might not have fine plumage, but we did. Gunhild was now old enough to know that her father was leaving, and she wept. It touched me. Steyana was too young to know too much, but I knew that there would come a time when he wished to sail with me, and that would in turn bring tears from Mary. Lodvia brought the ships from Reba, and the ten drekker in our fleet waited close to the port for King Swain, and the sixty ships he would be bringing. While we waited, Lodvia told us what he had learned from Axel. Hawke's father-in-law traded not only with Frankia and the Empire, but also England. He knew the leaders, and gave us information about their defences. We had no need to worry about his tongue being loose, as he knew he would benefit from our success, and he ensured that none of his ships would be anywhere near the east coast while we attacked. Ulf Chettel Snilling, some men call him the Bold, is the local lord, and while not an earled man, we have heard that he is a good leader, and he will not develop a sudden sickness as did Elric. This man will fight. It is said he is descended from the Saxon hero Britnoth, who fell at the Battle of Malden. 
whatever the truth of his heritage, he is not to be underestimated. So long as Karl advises the king, then all should be well. We had become used to weak Saxons, and I wondered if this might be a stiffer test of our new warriors. Knut felt himself to be one of those new warriors. When Karl had come to tell us of our raid, he had brought a burney and helmet for Knut. He had grown over the winter and broadened out. The training had made him stronger, and he had skills. None of us wanted him to be in the front rank of a shield wall, but he could now defend himself and use a spear and a shield. I was curious how he would be used, but that was as far as it went. With my new responsibilities, should we use the boar's snout formation, I could not afford to be distracted by worrying about the king's son. At least he now knew his way around a drecker and what his function was. He was Thorsten's assistant, and he commanded the ship's boys. He did not have to do as they did, but he had sailed enough to give commands, especially to the four young boys for whom this would be their first raid. Lodvia had also found a Saxon who worked for Axel the Swede, Edgar. He knew the river, and when the rest of the fleet hove to, we passed on the information to Carl Three Fingers. The result was that we would lead the fleet to assault the city. It meant that once we reached the coast of the East Angles, then we would follow Lodvia. We had now sailed enough times with King Swain and his fleet to be more confident about the way we sailed. We were no longer wary of a drecker suddenly appearing at night to ram into our steerboard. I did not realise, until that voyage, the advantages such confidence gave. It meant that when we were not on watch we were able to sleep soundly rather than with half an ear for the sound of a collision. We made the crossing in four easy days. The new sea serpent had seemed eager to show us what she could do, but Thorsten restrained her. The time would come when we would be able to unleash her full potential. We did not need it as we sailed to Northwick. When we saw to the west the smudge that was the coast, we hove to, for we had mail to don and a mast to place on the mastfish. We wished to be invisible. In addition, one or two drecker were a little tardy and the sun had yet to set we would begin to row and head west as the sun dipped towards the horizon and use our oars. Lodvir would lead and we would be close behind. Knut was given the unenviable task of sitting astride the prow and giving hand signals to avoid us ramming Axel's gift. Once we were ready, we began to row. It would be in silence to avoid alerting the countryside and it would be steady for we did not need speed. We had miles to row, and a steady rhythm would help us. Those of us close to the steerboard had a great responsibility, for the rest would take their cue from us. We had to keep steady and maintain a regular pace with Lodvia. To that end, the Jarl stood close to us and slapped his thigh to give us the beat. He, in turn, was guided by Canute. As we rode through the flatlands and fens of the land of the East Angles, I could not but reflect that we worked well together. The days of Thrond and Discord were gone. The entire crew were in harmony, even with the addition of an outsider like the princeling Canute. Thorsten kept an eye on Canute as the steering board edged us around the bends in the river. That they were not severe was good. We caught the whiff of both wood smoke as well as animal and human waste as we ghosted along the river Yare. People in the small settlement at the mouth may have seen us as we sailed along the river, but as no church bell had tolled, it meant they either had no church or had decided not to risk our wrath. I suspected the latter. Even without sails, our drecker would have been seen as grey shadows on the water. Our guide had told us that there were neither towns nor villages between the mouth of the river and Northwick. That was confirmed as we sailed down a silent river. Only the oars striking the water and hulls as they slid through the air made a sound. This was the time of year when the days were becoming longer than the nights, but not by much, and the first hint of false dawn must have appeared ahead, for we were ordered by Swain Skulltaker's slaps to row a little faster. Lodvia's guide must have recognised that we were close. When Thorsten began to put over the steering board and our Jarl instructed us to raise our oars, then we knew we had arrived. 
our fleet would tie up first, and the rest would use us to make a long port. We would fill the river, and our drecker would become a bridge into the heart of Northwick. A shout from the shore and the sound of a tolling bell let us know that we had been seen. Our ship's boys were fast, and we were secured to the wooden quay before we had finished stacking our oars. I did not bother with Saxon Slayer, and I slung my shield from my back. I had practised more with two swords, and found that I could manage the weapons easily. With a newly acquired pair of sayaxes tucked in the top of each sealskin boot, I was confident I could deal with the warriors we found in Northwick. It was not a burr, and there would not be a large garrison. The nearest burr was more than a hundred miles to the southwest. We three were the first off the drecker, and our feet landed on the wooden quay before Lodvia's men. Jarl Swain Skulltaker took command. On me. We needed to clear the drecker so that King Swain and his men could cross and follow us. Our job was to secure the wooden gates to the town. We would have a short time to do so as the town watch would be our only opposition. Of course, the tolling bell would rouse the men of the town and they would dress for war. That all took time and we raced towards the gate. The ones who had given the alarm were already racing through it, and a few arrows came our way from the fighting platform. I guess that the Saxons were petrified, for even as they slammed the gate shut, I heard someone curse as the bar was dropped. The four of us, with men close behind us, ran as fast as we could, and we simply hurled our mailed and metal-covered bodies at the gate. We were lucky. Or perhaps the Saxons were careless and they had not quite locked the bar in place. Our weight burst it asunder, and when it cracked open we almost fell as we stumbled over the watch who had been knocked to the ground. Leaving the five men to be dealt with by those behind, we ran towards the sound of the tolling bell. It would be either a church or a tower, but either way would be the rallying point for the defenders. If we could get there first and the town would be ours. We did not try to stay together, but ran along the stone-made streets, swinging our weapons at any who looked like they posed a threat. After we had struck six men, the rest fled before us. At our backs came the rest of the crew, and as I glanced round I saw that Knut was flanked by Faramir and Gandalf. I had not asked them to do so, but they knew it was the right thing to do. The bell was tolling from a large church, and while the lower part was stone, Roman by the look of it, the upper parts were wooden. Men were forming ranks before it, but they would be too late, and without breaking stride we threw ourselves at them. A spear was jabbed at me, but I partly deflected it with the sword in my left hand, and the head of the spear scraped along my mail. Had I not worn mail, I might have been hurt. Oath sword came down from on high to slice into the neck of the unfortunate Saxon. Our sheer weight had driven us through the thin line of Saxons, and we burst into the door of the church before they were able to close it. Had they done so, it would have been of little consequence, for we would simply have burned them alive. Their church might be a sanctuary if we were a Christian army, but despite the crosses worn by our king, we were still what they deemed to be barbarians. A priest raised a cross before me and said, God strike you dead, Viking! Hawk shouted, Kill him! I could not do so, for Mary would be unhappy. Her father had been a priest. I pulled back Oathsword and smacked it into the cross with such force that it broke his nose and knocked him unconscious. He would have a reminder of this day, but he would live. I do not think that Jarl Swain relished slaughtering women and children, for most of those in the church were not warriors. He roared, Flee! If you stay, then you die! We did not need slaves, and their flight would make others run too. We wanted the riches of the city and not its people. They saw the barbarians with bloody swords, and they ran. There were four doors in the church, and they used them all. We had been the first inside of the walls, and so there was no one in the north part of the town. That was the way that they fled. Lodvir, secure the church and its treasure. Hi, Jarhon, with me. It was a clever move on the part of the Jarl. 
He knew that the rougher parts of the city would be close to the river where there was trade. The better homes and the houses of the merchants would be in the north part of the city where it would be quieter. Our pursuit made those who thought about collecting treasure from beneath their floors think twice and just run. By the time we reached the north gate the sun had risen, and so far as we could tell the only ones left in the walls of Northwick were Danish. With the gates in our hands we systematically went through every house to dig up treasure and take the other valuables that they had within their homes. We had a rich haul, and by the middle of the day we had returned to our drecker to store what we had. Bolly had made the ship so that we had two holds to use, and it was the forward one we filled with the treasure. The ships of the Longport were largely empty, as the war band was busy doing what we had done, and looting. It took two days to empty the town, by which time the Saxons had raised an army to face us. They arrived at the south side of the Longport. They outnumbered us, but that did not worry us. Their leader was indeed Ulf Chettel Snilling, and he looked like a warrior who could handle himself. He had scale armour and a good shield and sword. He took off his masked helmet, a sign that he wished to speak. He came forward with his oath sworn, and we went with King Swain, Carl Threefingers, and Jarl Swain Skulltaker. Danes, do we fight, or will you leave? King Swain smiled. There is still much to take in this land. England is rich and Denmark is poor. Ulf Chettle the Bold snorted. I doubt it, for you bleed this land dry. We will fight you. King Swain nodded. And many of your men will die. More than we will lose, for my men are mailed and powerful. Yours are farmers with bill hooks. Do you really want your people to be slaughtered? Even the oath-sworn who faced us were not all mailed in contrast to us who each wore a gleaming mail shirt. After looking at our numbers, the Saxon gave a resigned nod. Then, can we have a truce while we collect gold to pay you to leave? With a magnanimous bow, the king said, Of course, a week. Ten days would be better. Ten days, then. As soon as he said it, then I knew that King Swain had no intention of honouring a truce. Ulf Chettle made the mistake of not asking for an oath. King Swain purported to be a Christian, and had the Saxon asked him to swear an oath on a cross, then the breaking of the truce might not have happened. The Saxons left, but not without leaving five hundred men camped just half a mile south of the river. Once we had crossed to the Longport, King Swain called a council of war. I was there to watch Canute, who stood close to his father. This was, I think, the start of a change in their relationship. He now saw his son as a potential heir. He might not be the one who would become King of Denmark, but he definitely saw him as a potential leader of some sort. We have some days to empty and then burn this town. We wait until the wind is blowing from the south to do that. Tomorrow I want Jarl Eric of Heatherby to take the horses we have captured and find another place we might raid. I want the rest of you to raid the land close by and take what food you can. As the Saxons are camped south of the river, then it will perforce have to be the north side. Lodvia asked, And the truce? King Swain laughed means nothing. If they bring the gold within a couple of days, then I might honour it, but I think that they are simply raising a larger army. In that he may have been right, for the Saxon general did not look afraid of a fight. Just afraid of a fight he knew he would lose. It told us much about our king. As the Saxons were close to the south bank of the river, it was decided to move the ships of the king to that bank. That pleased us, as it meant we no longer had a bridge over our drecker, and we could use the whole hold. Thorsten would be happier about that, for he liked a balanced ship. We found little food, and from those we found it seemed that the land had a famine. 
Perhaps God had abandoned the English and the lack of food was a sign. Whatever the reason, we did not enjoy the normal feast we usually did. Jarl Eric returned so quickly, within a day and a night, that we knew he had found a target worthy of breaking a truce, but it was better news than we expected. Almost thirty miles south of here, Kingswain, is Thetford. Not only does it have fine churches, the King's Mint is there. They make all the coins for this part of the world. It would make the treasures taken thus far seem like nothing. He made an instant decision. Tomorrow, before dawn and hidden from the Saxon camp, we take the crews of my ships and raid Thetford. Jarl Swain Skulltaker, you will remain here, and I will leave four of my crews to watch my ships. If the wind changes tomorrow, then fire Northwick. It should attract the attention of the Saxons. We will return in three days. He turned to his son. Would you like to come raiding with us? Canute was much taller these days, and whilst not as tall as his father, he was closer in height than he had been when the king had sent him to us. He was able to look directly at his father. Will there be a battle? The king looked at Jarl Eric, who shook his head. There is no wall, and we only spied thirty warriors and their thane. Canute shook his head. Then I will stay here, for I have not seen a wooden town burned. That was not quite true, for we had burned Exeter, Wilton, and Sarum. It told me that he was making an excuse and wished to stay with us. I wondered how his father would take the rejection. He dismissed it easily. Your loss, and I doubt that we shall see a battle. This Ulf Chettel must be like Elric and will not have stomach for a fight. From what I had seen and heard, I thought him wrong. Of course, if the king took the mint and all its coins, then the treasure would go to him. He might share some, but there was no compulsion for him to do so. Jarl Swain was philosophical about the matter. We were the first in Northwick, and we took more than did the king. We are saved a sixty-mile march. We eat well here, and the wind, I think, is changing. Tonight we might be able to light the fire the king wishes. We descended once more into the city to see if we had missed anything, and Canute came with me. I noticed that Faramir and Gandalf also followed. I was surprised, Canute, when you did not go with your father. You would gain riches. He smiled. When I inherit, I will gain all that belongs to my father, or half at least. Besides, I think that there is more chance of a battle here. We all stopped, for he seemed so confident in his words. Are you now Fay? Do you have the ability to see into the future? I deliberately avoided using the word Norn, and especially not Vathandi, as I did not wish to invoke their enmity. No, Sven, but I think that this Saxon will have us watched, and if he sees more than two-thirds of our men leaving to head south, knowing that they break the truce, then he might break the truce himself and attack us. There was a phrase my mother had used, out of the mouths of babes. What Canute had said made perfect sense. The Saxon camp had five hundred men already in their camp. Ulf Chettle the Bold could quickly reinforce them, and perhaps the king was right. It could be that the Saxons were raising a better armed army to fight us. At the very least they could cause mischief to our ships, and King Swain had conveniently now moored most of them on the south bank of the river. As soon as we returned to Jarl Swain I told him what Canute had said. He nodded. That makes sense, and explains why the back of my neck is itching. Lodvia, have two ships used to bridge the gap between the Drekker in the middle of the river so that we can cross to the other side. Choose Drekker we can burn if we have to. When I fire the city, take half of our men to reinforce the south bank. We had something to do, and we set about the arson eagerly. By burning the town, with the wind now blowing from the southwest, it would ensure that the north bank would be safe, and there would be no places for an enemy to hide. We used every man and boy to light the fires, and we worked our way south, so that the last place we fired was the wooden ward of the town. As we stood on the quay, 
all that remained were the warehouses and the key. They would be burned when we left, if we left. The Jarl was in control, and his mind had already planned the next steps. Thorsten, I give you command of all the ships. I want the boys and the captains ready to defend these Drekker, and if they are threatened, to sail them into the middle of the river. We dare not lose these ships, or we cannot get home. We would die the richest Danes in England. I will sound my horn five times if you are to abandon us. That made Thorsten smile. Do not worry, Jarl Svein. They shall not get their hands on our new Drekker. The fire we had lit made the night day. King Swain and Carl Threefingers might even see the glow in the eastern sky and wonder. If all had gone well, they would have taken the town and the mint by noon. It is in the nature of men who enjoy a victory to celebrate. They would be in the town enjoying the food and ale there, but they would have men watching the land. The fire would be seen, and King Swain would know that his orders had been obeyed. By the time we were ready, Lodvia had secured two drekker so that we had a narrow bridge. It was not a long port, and by the severing of the ropes which attached the two ships then the bridge of boats would be broken. We might lose half the fleet, but we would still have ships we could use to sail home, and, more importantly, treasure in our holds. Lodvia had organised the men who had been left to watch the Saxons, and we four, along with Canute, joined him. Falmer Flamebearer says that the Saxon camp is quiet. He and his men were about to go to bed when I came. The Jarl nodded and smiled at Falmer, who was an older warrior. Do as you planned, Falmer, but have your men ready to rise and fight. Aye, Jarl Swain. And us? We too sleep, Lodvir, but without fires. Canute said, But I might be wrong. I am young, and if no one else thinks this... My foster father smiled. I should have thought of this as a possibility, and all that you did, Canute, was open the wind hole in my mind to see it. If we have to endure a cold night sleeping on the ground in mail, then so be it. But before you sleep, Canute, find a good horse. If you are right, then I want you to ride to Thetford and fetch your father and his army, for if they do plan mischief then they will bring far more men than we have at our disposal. Aye, foster father. He seemed pleased at the prospect of doing something so noteworthy. As he went, the Jarl nodded. I have hopes for that one. He may change, but I see in him a strong man with a sharp mind. Although we lay down to sleep, we had four or five men in each group of sleepers watching. It would not matter if they dozed, for they would be sitting, and you can never have a sound sleep like that. It was Dreng who shook me awake. Sven Saxon sword, we've spied movement towards the Saxon camp. I stood immediately and listened. Sure enough, there were sounds, and although dawn was not far off, the sounds were not of men waking and lighting fires. There was the jingle of mail. I roused the Jarl and Canute. Jarl, the Saxons are coming. Knut, ride to your father. If they leave as soon as you reach them, then we might be saved. Knut just nodded and ran to the horse which he had left saddled and tethered. It was thirty miles to Thetford, and if he did not spare the horse or himself, he could be there not long after dawn. I doubted if the whole army could reach us, but even a couple of hundred, force-marched or using the horses and ponies they had taken, might prevent us from being massacred. We roused the men silently. The movements we had heard did not suggest an imminent attack. That would be improbable anyway. Ulf Chettle Snilling would have heard of Swain's treachery by noon, then he would have had to gather his men and march to the camp. We had time. The fires of the burning city had died, but there was a pall of smoke behind us. It would disguise us from the rising sun and slow down the arrival of dawn. If Canute and the Jarl were right, then the Saxons might seek to win this war by destroying our ships. To do that, they had to approach silently, or else we might simply sail downriver. It was dawn, and the sky was a little lighter when we saw the movements of the Saxons. 
We had not stood to make a shield wall, but men crouched with weapons ready. The only ones the Saxons would see, and they would be solitary shadows, were the sentries they expected to see. We saw the Saxons because we were looking to see them. Our men and the four crews left by the king were in a half circle with each end anchored at the river and the extreme of our drekkar. The centre of our line was held by the crew of Sea Serpent. Even our new warriors were trained so well that the Jarl could be confident that they would hold. To our right was Lodvir and his crew. Even if the flanks crumbled, then we could fall back to the Drekka. Obligingly, the Saxons did not move until dawn had broken. We saw their line as they began to move towards us. We four were standing, but the rest still crouched, laid down, or were seated. There were at least two thousand of them. Ulfchettle the Bold had raised the local feared and brought more mailed men than when he had first come to the aid of Northwick. I saw the mail of thanes as they led their farmers and townsfolk towards us. We had few archers, but the ones we had were here in the centre behind us. There were no slingers, for they were on the dreckers. Archers, be ready. We watched the Saxons move forward steadily, and already I was impressed by this Ulf Chattel. He had not indulged in the normal practice we had seen before. There had been no ceremony exhorting God to strike us down. His men advanced behind a wall of shields and spears. There were not as many mailed men as we had seen at Dean, but there were enough to stiffen the Saxon line. The Jarl waited until they were two hundred paces from us and then shouted, Rise, shield wall! Hawk, the horn! As every man rose and we faced the Saxons with our shields and spears, five clear notes rang out. Thorsten knew his business and the captains and boys would have been ready, but what they were about to do took time and we would have to buy them that time. The payment would be dead warriors. He would have to untie the drekkers from their moorings on both sides and then move them so that they were in a long double line in the centre of the river. They would have to be far enough from the banks to prevent the Saxons from getting close to them, and they would need to be anchored. They would give us support if we found our backs to the river, but I hoped it would not come to that. As soon as the horn sounded, the Saxons stopped and looked at the Danes who had risen like wraiths from the ground. As they were in range, the Jarl shouted, Archers, loose! There were just a hundred arrows, and some struck mail, helmets and shields, but many were hit because they were not expecting it. I heard an order shouted, and a wall of shields covering both the front and top of the Saxons appeared. The next shower of arrows merely rattled off wood. They began to advance, but it was a slow march, for these were the feared. The seasoned warriors, the thanes and housecarls, could move faster, but these were farmers and villains who were unused to marching in time to their neighbours. All this suited us, for it gave more time for Thorsten to save the ships, and increased the likelihood that Canute would find his father and bring reinforcements. Lock shields! I was not next to the Jarl, for I was with Leif and Lars in case we had the chance for a boar's snout formation. It felt strange to be going to war without my family close by. This would be the first time since that raid in Wessex when I had found Oathsword. Weird. The men around me pressed close to my side and my back. Lars said, Do not worry, Sven Saxon Sword, we shall not let you down. The Oath Sword will not be lost while one of us lives. We swore an oath. I glanced at his brother, who nodded. When had they made this oath? Leif held up his right hand, and I saw the fresh scar along his palm. They had sworn a blood oath, and recently. It made me more determined than ever that they would survive. I shouted, We will all live. These are Saxon farmers we face, and we are the warriors of Ayrhan. We will teach these Easterners the lesson those in the West learn to their cost, that we are the best of the best. It was the right thing to say, and the men around me all cheered and shouted, Oath Sword! 
with the Jarl to my left, a few warriors away, and Lodvia the same number to the right, I knew that I would be as safe as any Danish warrior, but this was no Elric who came towards us, and Ulf Chettle the Bold was living up to his name. I know not if it was planned, but the men who faced us were not led personally by Ulf Chettle. He attacked our line to the right of Lodvia. A thane led his people towards me. I commanded the men around me, and I shouted, Thrust! I knew the importance of all our spears striking at once. The thane apart, our spears were all a foot longer than the Saxons, and I could see that our shields were better too. Our spears smashed into the Saxons. Some of our spears deflected theirs, while the ones which came at us were either blocked by our shields or mail. The thane's thrust was a good one. We both hit the other at the same time. The only difference that I could tell between the weapons was that Saxon Slayer had a narrower tip, and while his broad head hurt when it struck my barony, Saxon Slayer burst first one and then another six male links on his. I pushed harder, and the broader part of my spear enlarged the hole and then found flesh. I twisted the head to aggravate the wound and was rewarded with a spurt of blood. We both withdrew our weapons. Gandalfer and Snorri were behind us, and their spears had darted out too. As the Saxon line was pressed close to ours by the mass of men behind them, so those two spears found flesh. Gandalfers drove through the cheek of the thane, while Snorri's found the eye of the oathsworn next to him. The thane was hurt, but I could not bring another weapon to bear, for we were too close together. I used the only weapons I had, my head and my knee. I pulled back my head and butted the thane. He had a nasal on his helmet, but it mattered not, for I still managed to break his nose. At the same time I drove my knee up hard between his legs. He could not control his actions, and his head jerked forward, which allowed me to ram the edge of my shield under his chin. The combination of blows rendered him unconscious, and it was only the press of men which held him there. I took the opportunity as the weight of his mail dragged his body down to turn Saxon Slayer. I had enough space to drive the spearhead into his throat as he lay at my feet. I quickly turned the head up, and before the man behind could react I stabbed upwards with Saxon Slayer. It found flesh beneath his jaw and the spearhead entered his skull. As he was dying, his hands grabbed the haft of the spear and locked on. A Saxon sword hacked down at the same time and bit into the ash of the spear. I let it go, for I knew I could not rely on the weapon. Drawing Oath Sword, I could not resist saying its name. Oath Sword! The name acted like a spur, and with a roar and a cheer the men I led stabbed and stepped forward. Thanks to Snorri's thrust and the warrior wounded by Lars, we had space and we moved up to stab at those who were without mail. They were also not warrior-trained, and we were. Oathsword slashed across the neck of the first Saxon and gave him a quick and merciful death. The spears of those around me were still whole, and they either found flesh or forced back the feared who faced us. We were becoming, almost unconsciously, the boar's snout. Lodvir shouted a word of warning. Sven! Do not advance. The Saxons are close to our right flank. You will be surrounded. Was this to be like the Battle of Dean again? We were winning, but others were not. I nodded and shouted, Ayerhorn, hold! Let us make these East Angles bleed! The Saxons might not have understood my words, but they recognised our action and that we had stopped. They hurled themselves at us. It was futile, for their weapons were not good enough to penetrate the mail we wore, and our shields were all superior to theirs. When oath swords smashed down on the shield which was made of boards nailed together, I broke the shield and his arm. When I punched him in the face with my metal boss, he fell to the ground where his fellows trampled him to death. In their eagerness to get at me they struck blindly and with spears protruding from behind me and oath-sword darting like the tongue of a snake, they either died or were so badly wounded that they were out of the battle. 
the pressure ceased as they stood to face us. Jarl Swain Skulltaker shouted, The flanks are collapsing. Ayaran, fall back. I knew that the river was a good one hundred paces behind us, and we had space to walk, but I did not like the move. The Saxons took heart, and as we stepped back, they ran at us with renewed courage. The result was the same. We had yet to lose a single man from those around me, yet a wall of Saxons lay before us. The fact that they were poorly armed and protected explained their deaths, but as I looked to my right and left, I saw that our frontage had shrunk. Of the crews left by King Swain I saw not a single warrior. It was just the men of Eyjohan who were left, and that meant the odds were even more in favour of the Saxons. Had they continued their advance, then we would have been pushed into the river, and many of us would have perished, drowned by our armour. But Ulf Chettle the Bold also halted his men. We had paused in the middle of a battle. He was reordering his lines. Archers! Jarl Swain took advantage, and more of the Saxons who wore no mail died before they could raise their shields. Only fifteen or so were killed and wounded, but it halted any movement towards us. It took almost half an hour for the Saxons to reorganise their lines so that Ulf Chettle and his best warriors, all mailed, moved to face Jarl Swain, Lodvia and me. He had recognised our strength and intended to break us once and for all. Our wounded had been moved to the river, and without looking I knew that Thorsten and Griotard would have ferried the wounded back to the ships in the river, it would give them more men to defend our ships if we all died. We expected to die. Swain One Eye began a chant. It was to put heart into the warriors. The king did call, and his men they came, each one a warrior and a Dane. The mighty fleet left our home in the west to sail to Svalda with the best of the best. Swedes and Norse were gathered as one to fight King Olaf Tryggvason. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. The Norse abandoned their faithless king, a board long serpent their swords did bring. The Norse made a bridge of all their ships, determined that King Swain they would eclipse. Brave Jarl Harald and all his crew felt the full force of a ship that was new. Mighty ships and brave warriors' blades, the memory of Svalda never fades. None could get close to the Norwegian king, to his perilous crown he did cling, until Skulltaker and his hearth Weru attacked the side of the ship that was new. We did not finish the song, for the Saxon leader recognised what we were doing, and he ordered the charge. It was premature, and they were not all locked together. This time it was a mixture of swords and spears which came at us. I could see Saxon slayers still sticking from the dead Saxon. The housecarl who came at me had a two-handed axe, and his shield hung over his back. He ran at me so that he could swing it in an arc. Gandalfer and Snorri's spears still flanked me, but they would not stop him. I looked at the swing of the axe head and estimated where it would strike. That would determine if I used my shield or my sword. I guessed it would be my shield. I did the unexpected. As the axe came down, I dropped to one knee and angled my shield to take the blow. At the same time, I drove up with oath sword. My movement made him mistime his strike, and while he still hit my shield, the blow was not as hard as I had expected. Although he wore a long burney, my sword drove up into his unprotected groin, and when I felt flesh I rammed harder and twisted. My hand felt his breeks. They were wet, and when the axe fell to bounce from my shield, then I knew he was dead. As I rose, I found myself face to face with a Saxon who wore a short burney. The readjustment by Ulf Chettle the Bold was working, and we would not enjoy the success we once had. Even as I resigned myself to a glorious death here on the banks of the Yare, I heard a distant horn, and Griotard's voice as he roared, Hold, Ayahon! Carl Three Fingers and Canute fetched our men! The battle did not end then. I still had time to slay another two of the mailed enemy, 
but the Saxons saw the approach of our men, and I heard Ulf Chettle, at least I think it was him, shout, Fall back! Had we not been fighting for hours, we might have followed them, but it would have meant many unnecessary deaths. We had done all that could be expected of us, and saved the ships, but it had been the hardest battle I could remember since Svolder, and the only one where the Saxons gave a good account of themselves. Chapter 11 We lost many men that day. Even the clan of Eyrhon had lost fathers, sons and brothers. The majority of those who had died were the men of Hedebir. Four Drekka would need new crews, such had been the slaughter. Knut and Karl had fetched just five hundred men from the main warband, and the reason for such a small number was clear. They rode, and only that number of horses could be found. The king had retained twelve horses to pull the wagons with the vast treasure we had taken, and the rest were ridden by our rescuers. Knut was deemed quite rightly to be a hero. Had he not ridden so hard and been so accurate in his navigation, then Karl Three Fingers might have arrived too late. The Saxons licked their wounds and watched us. They were not defeated, but they had no fight left in them. We had a truce to recover our bodies, and I retrieved Saxon Slayer. It was good that we would not be fighting again this season, for I would have to make a new shaft. We burned our bodies. The truce meant we were not able to recover the mail and swords from their dead, but that did not matter, for we were just grateful to be alive. We left the burnt-out city of Northwick five days later, after we had fitted our masts and crewed the drecker of the warriors we had left. The dead. The famine in the land meant that there was no food, and we were reduced to eating the food we had brought for emergencies. The Saxons kept pace with us all the way to the mouth of the river. I saw Ulf Chettle the Bold astride a horse, and he waved his sword at us as we left. I did not know if it was a salute, or a sign that he thought they had won because he had made us leave. It mattered not. We had treasure, and our crew were largely intact. Just one warrior, Ulf Blacktooth, had died, and five were wounded. Many other ships sailed with half a crew. Our training had been vindicated and saved us. The king was grateful and we received a good share of the coins taken from the mint. He was not as generous as he made out as there were many of his men who now lay dead and unlike the widows of Ribba and Ayrhon, the families of his dead would not receive one silver penny. With favourable winds we did not have to row and we had neither slaves nor animals. The famine meant that we had been forced to eat the animals we had taken. It mattered not, for we had enough silver to travel to the markets of Normandy and Francia to buy them. In fact, we would not even have to do that, for Axel the Swede would be more than happy to use his increasingly large fleet of Nar to do so for us. It was as we sailed east that Knut told us of his journey. There were bands of Saxons who were guarding the crossroads, but my time with the clan has not been wasted. I became the bird which you heard but did not see. They were not mounted, and I was. I rode hard, and I confess that I had to leave the horse when I found our men. Carl Three Fingers had also had a premonition of danger, and he was already riding back, having left Thetford at dawn. He had with him seven hundred men, but only five hundred were mounted. He decided to take those, and that was how we came to reach you before the flanks had collapsed. I rode with him, and as we did so, he said that so long as you and your crew survived, there was a chance. He just feared that the Saxons would choose to attack you and eliminate the leader. We were lucky, and I do not think that I will choose to raid next year. We have enough gold and silver. It is land we need, and there is not enough in Denmark. Swain Skulltaker's words were like a cold shower, for he was right. We had not been defeated, and gained great glory. All the ones who had fought at Northwick spoke of the bravery of our clan, but it felt like a defeat. He was right, 
Men like Gandalfer, Snorri, Faramir, and Dreng needed land, and there was none to be had at Ayrhon. It came to me as the coast of Jutland came into view that we needed to share the land we had. A man was more likely to fight for his clan if he had land. I would speak to Mary about the idea which was fermenting in my mind. My foster father came to speak to me when we neared Ayrhon. I had been aware that he had been looking for an opportunity, but either Canute or one of his sons was always close, and he had bitten his tongue. Now the three were at the prow looking for the first sight of our home, and he called me over to the larboard side of the stern. There was no one there. The crew lined the sides as the wind took us home. Sven, I would speak with you, and I hoped to do so on the way home, but... I nodded. Once we have unloaded the drecker, then there will be too many people close by. On the morrow, come early to the hall, and we will talk. I was intrigued. Of course, Jarl, but I know not why you wish to speak with me. And if I tell you now, hurriedly, then there will be no need to meet, and I might choose the wrong words. I will speak with Agnetta, for she helps to clear my mind, and I know that you will do the same with Mary. For you not, it is nothing calamitous or should cause you to worry, but it has been on my mind since your father was killed. A chill came over me. Had the Norns been spinning once more? Egbert and the thralls were waiting for us, but there was little for them to take. The coins we had taken were in my chest, and they just carried the chest and my shield. Was it not a successful raid, my lord? There are neither animals nor slaves. There is gold and silver. Your land is enduring a famine, Egbert, and there is little to take. He nodded. That explains the merchants who've been coming here to buy from us. The preserved herring and salted pig are in great demand. I did not know whence the merchants took it. Ethelred's policies still had an influence on every person who lived in his land, for he was spending his country's taxes on food rather than giving it to us. How much longer could he continue to do so? We had not been away for long, and yet I saw a change in my children. Gunhild could now run, and she babbled. I caught a few of the words, but Anna and Mary seemed to understand them all. I knew that my ear would become attuned to their sounds in time. That I was whole pleased my wife. I did not tell her all that we had done, for I knew that it would upset her. But I told her of the famine that her land endured. She frowned, and that was a sure sign that she sought a reason which would sit well with her beliefs. When she could not come up with an immediate explanation, she said, And now you must bathe, husband, for you have the smell of war about you. She was right, of course, and I nodded. There are clothes I have had made for you. One of the thralls will show them to you when you have bathed. Ciara, hot water and food for your lord. Ciara was another of the slaves taken when we had been in Wessex. They had all adjusted well to life in Denmark, and it was proving not to be as terrible as they had imagined. That night we ate well. This raid had not enjoyed the range of food we normally consumed, and the feast at my table tasted better than I remembered. When we had eaten and were seated before the fire, I brought up my idea. My love, you know that land is scarce here in Ayrhon. I, I do, and it is becoming more crowded, too. We have plenty of land, and it is producing a great deal. I thought to let those who live in my hall farm some of our land. She smiled. A Christian thing to do. I commend you, my husband. And while I think it is a good idea, the men to whom you will be gifting this land are not poor. Charity is for those who cannot help themselves. I like the idea, but I think that they should share our gift with us. That way it is in their interests to be productive farmers. I could not think of an argument against her, and, to be fair, it seemed a better idea than mine. The warriors who lived in the thrall hall, there were just three, Gandalfa, Faramir, and Siggy, were all proud men and would not simply accept my gift. They were all grateful to have a roof over their heads and rooms where their families could live. 
I decided that I would tell them of my offer, but I would wait until I had spoken to the Jarl. His request to speak to me still had me a little worried. Sleeping in my own bed with my wife cradled in the crook of my arm was one of the pleasures I looked forward to the most, and when my children burst in to join us in the bed I felt slightly resentful, but after a few moments of tickling them I remembered that they would soon become a different kind of pleasure for me. The cooks had prepared all the food I enjoyed the most so that when I went to meet Jarl Swain I felt replete. He was speaking with Canute when I arrived at his hall and I waited politely for them to finish. Canute was growing, and as he had shown in Northwick, was becoming a warrior with a mind. I knew that the next raid would see him fighting in a shield wall. It was what his father wished, and would show King Swain what kind of leader his son would be. His training would have to intensify, and that meant I would have to devote more time to him. He smiled and waved as he returned indoors, and my foster father strode over to me. He gestured towards the north. There was a good beach there, and the wind was not too strong. It would be a pleasant place to stroll. My other foster son did well, did he not, Sven? He saved us, Jarl, and the clan owes him much. Aye, you are right, and he has a place in his heart for the clan. That is down in no small part to you. Me? But Hawk and Swain spend more time with him than I do. Perhaps but it is you he speaks of when he talks to me. I would have you spend more time training him. He needs to be a warrior who is as good as you. I nodded with relief because now I knew what he had wished to say. I had already planned on doing so. He is now old enough to stand in the shield wall. He is, and that is not the matter I wish to discuss with you. I had been wrong. Although we did not try the boar snout formation at Northwick on the year, you showed me that day your skills as a leader. Once again it was you who managed to penetrate the enemy line and the clan was willing to follow you. Had our flanks not been so threatened we could have driven deep into the enemy lines, and we might have won without the need for Carl Three Fingers. I shook my head. I am not so sure, for Ulf Chettel the Bold was a cunning enemy. He chose to attack where we were weak. Had he fought against us from the start, then I doubt I would have made any inroads. You are modest, and that is good. There were some dunes covered in maram grass, and he gestured for me to sit next to him. Despite what you thought, your father and I were friends, and between us we led the clan. There were differences of opinion, and you know that. We differed in that he sought glory and fame. You already have both, but I know that you did not seek either. That speaks well of you. Just as your father and I led the clan, and his last raid apart worked in harmony, I would have you and I do the same. I release you from duties as my hearth were you. Hawk is now in Ribbe, and I have my eye on a couple who have been brought to my attention by Lodvir. Would you agree that Dreng and Snorri are the best young warriors? Aye, and they showed great skill when I first trained them. Nothing I have seen since makes me doubt my first view of them. My sons agree with you, and I will ask them to be my hearth weru with my eldest son. When you train new warriors, I would have the best two from each group identified. I want hearth weru who are young, so that they can strengthen the clan and show every young warrior that there is the chance to be given a barney and serve the Jarl. He smiled. Thanks to our victories, I have more male shirts than I can ever wear. I shall give two to Dreng and Snorri if they agree. Believe me, they will agree. I stared west towards England. But I still do not see what you mean about me leading with you. After your father died, then Lodvir took over and helped me to lead. It meant that when we went to battle I could rely on him to organise our warriors. He now has a wife and lives in Ribbe. He still fights with us, but the men of Ayrhon are no longer look to him. They already look to you, and I would have you use it. He smiled. They call you Oath Sword, and when you take out your weapon they all call out its name. 
for them you and the sword are the same. What say you? The ones in your wedge will be the core of your warriors, and the ones who stood behind them will be given the chance to join you. Join me? It sounds like we are to be a different clan. No, not different. But you will be the head of the spear that is the clan of Ayrhon. Twice it has been you and those who follow you who stepped forward and broke the enemy line. I am not a fool, and the Norns have spun. I now see what they are trying to tell me. When they put that sword in your path, it was to change not only your future, but also the future of the clan. I would be a reckless fool if I ignored them. He stood and stretched. If you wish a suggestion, I would say that if you have them all paint a sword on their shields, it would help, for when an enemy sees it, then they will know what they face. Canute told me that his father desires the sword more than anything. There are many other warriors who agree with him. You have a name, foster son, and men will seek you in battle. You cannot change it, for it was spun. You can, however, use it. What say you? I smiled. You are right, foster father, and I cannot escape my fate. I might wish to be anonymous, but I know that I cannot. If I am to be the warrior that my father and you wished me to be, then I must embrace this change. I will do as you ask, and I will help you to lead the clan. Then you are now Herr Seer of Eigerhorn. The king gave his permission when he gave me the silver. I had this in mind then. He took from his pouch the talk which was worn on ceremonial occasions by the Herr Seer. I had not seen it for years. I nodded my thanks and took it. I confess that I was unable to speak for a while. I was so young and had achieved so much. Swain Skulltaker was right. When the sword had called to me, then my life was changed. What of Swain One Eye? He is your eldest. Would he not expect to be Hersir? King Swain said that when I die, my eldest shall inherit the title of Jarl. Swain knows that, and he is content. That pleased me, for I did not want to rob my cousin of his birthright. I told Mary when we returned, and she was delighted, for she understood the status it brought with it. I then sought out the warriors who were in my wedge. I did not want to order any man to follow me, and so I asked each of them in turn. It took the rest of the day to speak with them all, for Lars and Leif lived some way from the sea. To my amazement, they all agreed with such alacrity that I was taken aback. It was almost as though they had conspired. My last visit was to Canute and One Eye. I spoke to my cousin first, for I wished no animosity that I was Hersir. I told Swain that I would happily relinquish the title if he objected. He laughed. Cousin, you have been marked for greatness since the first time you went to war and you followed me. I knew then that Swain Swainson would never be the warrior that you were, and when my eye was taken it was confirmed. My greatness will come because a hundred years from now men will still sing my songs. Besides, I shall be Jarl one day, and that suits me. I gestured for Canute to join me outside. Our foster father has asked me to spend more time training you to be a warrior. Are you happy for me to do so? Of course, Sven, and I know that your training will make me a better warrior than my brother, Harold. Since I first watched you as a youth, I have wanted to be like you. I am not sure that I will be able to use the same skills as you, for you seem to know when a blow is coming before the warrior who strikes it. That is a gift from God, but I hope that I can pick up enough to give me a better chance of surviving a battle. The four dead crews I saw when we rode to your side at Northwick were a warning of what can happen when leaders make mistakes. It was as close to a criticism of his father as I had heard, but it was just vague enough to be deniable. Perhaps it was a test. Canute was his father's son and a more cunning man than his father I had yet to meet. His son must have inherited some of his traits. That first day exhausted me, and I was chastised by Mary when I entered my hall. 
you have barely spent an hour with your children. They are upset that their father ignores them. Steyanna may not yet be able to form coherent words, but I saw the hurt in his eyes. Today you gave your time to the Jarl and the clan. Good. Tomorrow you give it to your children. Most Danish warriors would have resented being spoken to like that by their wives. But I was not like most warriors, and I agreed with her. Of course, and you are right. I kissed her, and she beamed. All was well. Gunhild's babble soon sounded like words, and I found to my delight that I could speak to her. Steanna tried to talk, and I am guessing that in his baby head he was speaking like we did, but it just came out as grunts. At first I forced myself to play with them and ignore the tasks which tapped inside my head. Then the tapping stopped and I found myself enjoying their company. When Mary fed Theanna I had Gunhild to myself, although Anna was always close by in case I needed her. I learned that Gunhild did not like the word no. I had tears, and that was when Anna came to my rescue. Lord, Mistress Mary is firm with her when she weeps. She must learn to accept discipline. I nodded, but I found it hard to do so. In my heart I wanted to stop her tears by acceding to her demands and to make her smile. On the third day it was such a pleasant morning that I thought to leave the hall and seek the ash haft. I asked Mary if Gunhild could accompany me as it was a walk. Of course, but make sure she is wrapped well and... She nodded towards the hand axe in my belt. Be careful. I knew I could not manage two of them, and Gunhild and I slipped out of the hall while Anna distracted my son. It was a long walk, but Gunhild was a curious child, and as I explained what we saw, she replied to every piece of information with the same word. Why? I found myself struggling to find some answers, and that was good, for it made me question what I knew. We found the stand of ash, and I gave her a drink of the cow's milk Anna had given to me. Now, let us find the piece of wood I need. We are looking for a piece which is straight and longer than I am, yet it should be no thicker than your leg or arm. She nodded attentively, and, taking my hand, we searched for the perfect piece of wood. Gunhild took the task seriously and even seemed to enjoy it. I had resigned myself to the single one we had found which was not quite as tall as I was, when Gunhild, who had disappeared behind some ash, shouted, Here, is this one right? I hurried around, grateful that my wife would never know that I took my eyes from her, and saw that she had found a copsed ash tree. Six branches had sprung and grown upright. She had seen and found what I had not. There was the perfect spear shaft, but it was in the middle of the others. The other five would make serviceable spears, but not for me. I would have to cut those away first before I could take the perfect one in the centre. I seated her on the lightning-struck tree trunk and gave her some honey cakes while I toiled. I took my time, for I saw that there would be six spears I could have. There were younger warriors who would need a spear, and all the ones I cut were the perfect thickness. Gunhild squealed with delight as each branch fell. I stacked them close by to her. The last one would become the new Saxon slayer, and I took the greatest care in its cutting. It was after the sun had begun to dip that I finished, and I hefted the ash branch over my shoulder. What about the others? Are they just to stay here? No, I shall send men for them. They will be useful. You did well to find what I did not. That pleased her. Father, are there any girls who become warriors? I had heard of some, but not in our land, and I did not think that her mother would approve. No, it is just boys who train as warriors. Why? That is the way it has always been. Why? I saw that I had entered the circle of wise, and there was only one way out. Break the circle. Girls are different to boys, Gunhild. They can do things that boys cannot do. Your mother gave birth to you and your brother. I cannot give birth. Because you are a man. Aye. 
There had been no why, but it soon followed. Why are there men and women? Why are they not the same? I almost used the word all father, but I knew that Mary wished our children to be Christian, and so I said, God, in his wisdom, made us either men or women. It helps to keep the world in harmony. Warriors protect the women from danger, and women ensure that our people grow. I am tired, father. I leaned the ash shaft against the sheep fence of Galma Galmerson and hoisted her upon my shoulders. Picking up the shaft in my right hand, I continued home. You would not like being a warrior, Gunhild. Why? Do you not like it? Her question, as simple as it was, made me almost stop as I struggled to find an answer. My thoughts were just a heartbeat ahead of my words as I answered her. I am good at what I do, Gunhild but I do not enjoy killing, even though the men I kill are trying to kill me. If I did not have to kill again, then I would be a happy man, for it would mean that there was no need. Even as I said the words, I saw the lie. The need was not mine, it was the king's and his ambition. When I had defended Ayrhon against the raiders, then there was a need, but all the men I had killed in England and at Svolder had been at the behest of the king. Yet I could not refuse him, for he was my king. I now understood those men who had decided that they did not want to obey a king and had sailed to the land of ice and fire. I could never do that, but I understood why men did. Father? Yes, Gunhild. You are quiet. Why? Because, my love, you have put thoughts in my head, and that is what men do. They wrestle with the demons inside them. Like the ones who come at night? Come at night? Yes. When you are away at sea and I sleep, creatures, horrible ones, come into my head and I wake up crying. Anna sings me to sleep, but it is hard, for I fear that the demons will come back. I squeezed her hand with my left one. No demons will come into our hall, you have my word. She was silent for a while and then said somewhat sadly, That is good, for you are home. When you sail away again, then will the demons come again? I had no answer for that, and the joy of finding the ash evaporated as I thought about her words. One day the king would call and I would have to go to war again. I had not thought about this before but now, when I was at sea, I would know the effect it had on my children. We had a workshop close to the hall. Egbert had made it when I had been on one of my raids. There was an anvil and a furnace. Anna brought Stjana and Gunhild to watch when I attached the spearhead to the haft. I had smoothed and polished the haft, and I was pleased with it. I had prepared the socket end, but this time Saxon Slayer would be different. I still had some burny metal, and I made a metal collar. Before I sank the spearhead into the socket, I prepared the collar around the top of the spear. An enemy would not be able to hack it off so easily, and it would blunt the sword which struck it. I poured molten metal into the socket to bed in the spearhead, and then I used the fire and my hammer to beat the collar and make the head secure. That done, I left it to cool. I was sweating heavily when I had finished. Come, let us leave Thor's workshop and go where it is cooler. The words were barely out of my mouth before I regretted them. Who is Thor? Is he one of your men? I saw Anna grasp her cross and I shook my head. You know the stories from the Bible, the ones Anna and your mother tell? She nodded. Well, Thor is like that. He is from a story we have here in Denmark. He makes weapons and armour. She seemed satisfied with my answer. She liked stories. I would have to watch my words from now on. I had done as I had promised, and I had spent three weeks giving every moment to my children. But I was now a leader of men, and Canute came one morning to ask when I would do as I had promised and begin to train him. Mary was there and she gave a nod. 
I had done what she had asked, and she understood that I was a warrior. Now, we can do some spear work. I will call Gandarfa and the others. Knut smiled. They are already waiting, Sven Saxon sword. I had also finished the other five spear hafts, and without their metal heads, were perfect for training. With my young warriors, who had fought in many battles, we were able to teach Canute what he ought to do. He had seen us do this, but watching and doing were two entirely different things. He tripped and fell three times. Faramir had also had the same problem, and he gave Canute the solution. We always move with our sword leg first. Think sword and move that leg. It solved the problem, and Canute began to improve. He also found it hard to hold the long ash haft for long periods, and there was no simple answer to that. I told him how Lodvir had made me hew down trees and carry them back to strengthen my arms. You will need to be stronger, for some battles, like the one on the Yer, may last hours. A battle is not only a test of skills, but strength and endurance. When you are not training with us, then you should be training alone and making your arms stronger. I was aware, while we trained Knut, that I was also training what were in effect my men, and so we began to modify the way we fought in a wedge. Laris and Leif were not close by, and so I alternated other warriors to stand behind me when we were in a wedge. Who knew what might happen in the maelstrom of a battle? We worked on my commands to change formation. Speed could win a battle, and after many days of training we were able to move seamlessly from one formation to another. As winter began to bite and the days became shorter, so our training intensified. Hawk and his wife Frida now lived in Reber. They had a fine hall, but that of Axel the Swede was almost palatial. Hawk and his wife often stayed in Axel's hall. Axel seemed to really like Hawk, and the two got on. It was from Axel that we learned more of Ethelred and England. The famine had caused many deaths. Ethelred had also become something of a tyrant. The massacre on St. Bryce's Day was just one of a series of savage and ruthless acts which eliminated any opposition to him. A new name was mentioned, and when we feasted in the Jarl's Hall to celebrate the birth of the White Christ and the Winter Solstice, Hawk still visited regularly, and it was on one such visit that he told us of the new Erlodman of Mercia, Edric Striona. The man had come from nowhere and now appeared to rule Mercia for the king. He appeared to be the antithesis of Ulf Chettel Snilling, in that he was not a warrior, but a plotter. It said much about King Ethelred that he advanced men like Edric Streona, whilst seemingly ignoring warriors like Ulf Chettel. There will be no raid this year for the king. Hawk had looked at his father, who knew what the look meant. And there will be no raid from Reba and Ayerhorn. Our young men who are yet to be trained have time to develop and to grow, while those who have married can father new warriors. I nodded. And land? Where will these fathers and warriors get land, foster father? I saw Canute look up at my question. Swain Skulltaker shook his head. That I cannot answer. Perhaps we should farm the sea. We can use more men to fish and gather the sea's harvest. I nodded. If they choose to do so. Men always have choices, Sven. You chose to give land to your men. That has proved successful. Other men must make their own decisions. We cannot make them for them. The Jarl was clever. By planting the idea at the feast, by the time the days lengthened, then many of the warriors who had no land built fishing boats and began to do as he had suggested. In a year without war, we became richer through our hard work. They became better seamen and learned about weather, waves and the wind. When war came, we would be better prepared. The Jarl was also correct about the growth of the clan. Mary, as well as many other of the women in the clan, were with child. Steyana and Gunhild would have a brother or sister soon. Hawk and One-Eye would also be fathers. 
that year was the most peaceful any could remember. Yet, for Hawk, there would be a worry. Chapter 12 1006 Kent It was Thorkel the Tall who was the reason we went raiding again. While the king and the rest of us had enjoyed a peaceful time, he had sailed with the Yom's Vikings and enjoyed great success. He urged King Swain to come and join him, for he said King Ethelred had given himself up to wine and women and appointed men to lead who were not warriors. The Jarl was summoned to Hedebir, and when he returned we were told of our target as well as news of the troubled kingdom. Canute sat with the Jarl and his Hearthweru. He listened intently, for he was almost ready to take a greater interest in his father's kingdom. We are to raid Kent. There are ports there that are rich and are not protected by a burr. Carl Threefingers is a clever man, and he wishes to keep the Saxons guessing where we will strike. And the famine? My question was born because I did not know why we needed to raid. It is over. The last harvest was a good one and they have begun to sell their goods abroad once more. There will be coins, animals, and slaves. I shook my head. I need no more slaves. Since I gave my land to my men, I need fewer workers in my fields. I have good slaves now, and it would be foolish to risk bringing bad ones into my fold. Their silence told me that the others wanted slaves. Canute said, you know that there is an old English song which says that if the Danes were to get to Quichelmeshlaw, or as they call it now, Quichelm's Barrow, then all their land will become Danish. Do we know if this barrow is close to Kent? None knew, but I knew someone who would. I will ask my wife, Canute. She has a great knowledge of the land, for we read through many parchments when we were seeking information about the dragon sword. Canute came with me, and he asked Mary the question. She had heard the rhyme, and she knew where the place was. Oxnaford, where I believe many of your people were killed on St. Bryce's Day, is close to the barrow. It lies just a hundred miles or so from White. That seemed to please Canute. Then, when we meet him, I will speak to my father, for it seems to me that if we had a foray to the north, then we might find this barrow. It could not hurt. After he had gone, Mary said, The princeling is ambitious. He would have the crown which Ethelred wears. My wife was a clever woman who could read people as well as she read parchments. He's the son of a king. What else can you expect? I would not take a crown if it was thrust upon me. Mary smiled, for she knew I meant every word. Before we left, Axel the Swede delivered some news to Hawk, which at the time seemed unimportant, but later was of great moment. The king had appointed a man called Edric Streona as the ruler of Mercia. Hawke had told us this the previous year, but now we saw the manner of the man. Edric had invited a great noble from southern Northumbria, Erlodman Elfhelm, to hunt with him, and had him murdered by one of his men, Godwin Portund. That it was done at the behest of the king was clear when Elfhelm's sons, Wolfia and Ufagat, were taken by the king and blinded. It made Ethelred the effective ruler of half of Northumbria. What it showed us was how ruthless this apparently Christian king was. The only one of Elfham's family to escape was his young daughter, Elfgifu, and her whereabouts were unknown. Once more Canute showed how sharp was his mind, for he saw immediately the importance of such an action. This Elfhelm of Jorvik was well thought of, and there will be people in Northumbria who are now resentful of the king. Many Danes and Norse live in Jorvik. My father could seize the opportunity. Jarl Svein Harkonason raided the north of Northumbria, and he knows the land well. The boy who had come to us to be trained was now almost a man, and I marvelled at the change. The warrior in him was down to the training we had given him, but the mind of the leader was from within himself. Just as the sword had chosen me, it seemed that Canute had been chosen to lead. I wondered if this would lead to conflict between him and his brother. Since the raid on Exeter, he had seen nothing of him. 
Although King Swain appeared hale and hearty, no man lives forever. Who would be the next King of Denmark? Our fleet left Danish waters just as the English were beginning their harvest. After the long famine it was eagerly anticipated, and every man who was available was working in the fields to gather as much food as they could. We used the same course as when we had raided Northwick. The difference was that when we saw the smudge of a coastline, we headed due south, knowing that the next place we saw after the estuary of the Thames would be the granary of England, Kent. Aboard our ship there was an air of confidence. The Jarl's idea of a crew within a crew had worked. The men who followed me now felt special, and others who were neither in the Jarl's Hathweru or my warriors were desperate to impress us, for they wished to be chosen. There was no moaning, and when we had to row then the crew put their backs into every stroke. When we hove to just off the coast of Kent there was such a positive mood as we donned our mail and stepped our mast that I felt there was nothing beyond us. Whatever the men of Kent threw our way we would overcome. We waited until dark before rowing silently towards the coast. We knew, again from Axel, that there was a river with a prosperous town, Sandwick, at its mouth. We liked to use rivers, for we could moor our ships where they would be safe from the vagaries of the weather and the tide. We rowed in, and this time it was the king who led the way. We sailed half a mile up the river so that we could moor safely without being rammed by one of the other drekker. We passed the town, and of course we were seen. We heard the cries of alarm. We had to row beyond the king's ship. The result was that we did not have the benefit of a wooden key, and so while the ship's boys tied us up, we leapt ashore. This would be the first time that I led my wedge, and it felt good as I ran ahead of the Jarl back towards the town. King Swain had caught the men of Sandwick unawares, and despite the alarm being given, he had breached their poor defences almost instantly. The result was that as we ran back down the river to the port, we met refugees fleeing from danger. Some of the women were so terrified that they hurled themselves in the river, only to find more of our ships looming up to land their men. Lodvia's Drekka struck three of them. The men who faced us had weapons, but they were no match for my men who were mailed. The men died, and the women who did not hurl themselves in the river prostrated themselves before us. Lodvia took them aboard his ship. By the time dawn broke, we had the port and all the ships which were tied up there. The men had either fled or been put to the sword, and any women and children who remained were taken and secured. There was no time for complacency, and the king sent us out in three columns to take as much plunder and grain as we could from Kent. The men of Ribbe and Ayohana were one of the columns. I like to think that we were one of the best. The reason was not arrogance. It was based on the fact that we had lost the fewest men in the raids thus far, and yet we had taken, the mint apart, the greatest treasure. We were sent north, and we ran, even while Sandwick was still being looted. We had to outrun any news of our arrival, and when we came upon half a dozen Saxon men also running north, then we knew that we would have surprise, and that there would be a settlement for us to raid. The men tried to defend themselves, but they were not warriors. We found the small port of Framsget, just five miles from Sandwick. It was nowhere near as big, but there were three large trading vessels in the harbour, as well as a dozen fishing boats that had just returned from a night of fishing. We had been lucky that they had not seen the approach of our fleet. The three trading ships were laden with goods for trade and were awaiting the tide. We took their crews and placed our own men aboard the ships. The small town had fine houses, and we had ample time to search them for treasure. While the three trading ships were sent back to Sandwick, and the men of the Ribbe completed the emptying of the town, the men of Ayohon continued to head north. We left Hremsket in the early afternoon, and our noses took us along the coast to cross low-lying ground and marshes towards the smoke we could see rising from another fishing port. We discovered an even smaller one than the one with the three traders. Merrigate was a huddle of houses and fishing boats with a jetty. It did not yield much in the way of treasure, but once again we had the catch from the fishing boats. After burning the houses, 
we boarded the fishing boats and, even though they were overcrowded, sailed back around the coast to Remersget. We ate well that night, and the next morning, after burning the town and sending the fishing boats back to Sandwick, we headed inland. We had taken fish, cargo and a little treasure, but we knew that there had to be great quantities of grain. Even as we headed north, we could see it ripening in some fields while others had already been harvested. For the next two months we rampaged through Kent without ever having to fight a battle. We saw warriors who, when they spied our numbers, melted back towards the Thames. They were not ready to face us. We had taken some thanes as prisoners, and before we executed them they were questioned, and we learned that Ethelred was in Mercia with his new favourite, Edric Streona. England was leaderless. Cantwerbur, despite its name and its mighty church, did not hold us up, and it yielded even more riches than the mint at Thetford. I thought then that we might return to Denmark, but as Gormanador came to a close, we boarded our already laden ships and sailed not east, but west. The traders we had taken in our raids, all eight of them, were sent home. Half went to Ribe and Ayrhon, and the other half to the king's home. We landed at our second home in England, White. The people who had lived there when we had first used it as a camp had long since departed. We had returned too many times for them to stay. I thought we might overwinter there. I did not want to. If we were not going to fight warriors, then I wanted to go home. The reason we did not was Canute. The princeling had raided with us, but once we had taken all there was to be had, he had visited his father in Sandwick. He planted the seed of the idea of taking the army to Quichum's Barrow. It appealed to the king, and as we would have to march close to Wintoncester, he saw it as a way of further humiliating King Ethelred. Leaving our ships well guarded, two thousand warriors marched north towards Oxnaford and Reddingas, which was where the Saxon king's father was buried. The Jarl was given the honour of leading the march. It was a double-edged honour. While it showed great faith in us, we would also be the first to face an enemy. If they chose to ambush us, then it was we who would suffer. My wedge was given the task of scouting. We marched a quarter of a mile ahead of the rest of our warband, and they were two hundred paces ahead of the main body. When we marched on the Roman sections of the road there was little to be feared, for the roads were straight, but in some places the roads had not been well maintained and trees had been allowed to grow alongside the road providing places of ambush. We had less than ninety miles to go, and it took us just three days. Reading us proved to be the hardest part of our journey, for the Saxons defended it. They did not ambush us, and when Jarl Swain Skulltaker arrived, he quickly ordered an assault on its wooden walls. With no spike-lined ditch, we took it within half an hour, and before King Swain could even order his own attack. The next day, with information taken from prisoners, we headed for the barrow. It was a mighty monument and stood out along the skyline. This time the king and his son led the procession to the top. We were relegated to watching from the base. We did not mind. At the top King Swain raised his standard and shouted, I claim the land of Quichelm for Denmark and my sons. It was in many ways meaningless, for we had not fought a battle and had no intention of staying there, but it seemed to inspire our army. We camped on the barrow, eating all that Reddingas had to offer, and then we headed south. The king's words must have had an effect, for the Saxons waited for us at the river Kennet just five miles from Reddingas. They lined the river and held the bridge. King Swain quickly convened a council of war. I was not included this time, but it mattered not. When Jarl Swain returned, it was with the news that our crew would be the ones who would force the bridge, while those warriors who had no mail would make crude rafts and cross the river. The thought of attacking the men guarding the bridge seemed daunting, for they were all mailed, but we had the chance to take that mail and their weapons. We did not shirk from the honour. 
Canute would also fight with us. He would be behind the Jarl and his men. It was my wedge that would lead the attack. The bridge was a wooden one and only wide enough for four or five men. As the men who waited for us in the centre were mailed, then it would be four of us who faced them. While our archers showered the Saxons with arrows, I spoke with my men. We will use the wedge and drive between the two men in the centre. Our three spears should be able to strike the two of them and we will split them asunder. The wooden sides of the bridge look weak and we may be able to make them fall into the river. They have only managed to block the bridge with sixteen men. The rest await us on the other side, and they are not mailed. We just keep going, for we know that behind us are the men of Ribba and Ayrhon. The bridge was just eighteen paces across, and I knew that speed would help us. The men grinned their agreement. The Jarl had waited patiently while I had spoken to my men. Are you ready, Sven? I nodded. Aye, foster father. We will run at them. Then begin your attack. I began banging my shield with Saxon Slayer and started to stamp my feet in time. The others formed up behind me and did the same. When Lars tapped me on the shoulder, then I knew that they were ready, and pointing Saxon Slayer towards the south, I shouted, Oath sword! and began to run to the bridge. The men who awaited us had their shields raised to save them from the fall of arrows and the slam of stones. It was our feet stamping on the ancient bridge which told them that we were coming, and it was only then that they attempted to lock their shields. I was right, and speed was our best weapon, for we struck the middle of their line before they had locked shields and before the second and third ranks had pushed their shields into the rear of the front rank. Saxon Slayer grated off mail and then found flesh as it hit the Saxon in the second rank. I heard a crack and a cry as one was knocked over the side into the river, taking part of the wooden parapet with him. The boss on my shield saved me from the spears of the mailed men on the bridge, and the spears of Lars and Leif enjoyed great success. My boots ceased to pound and echo when we burst through the last of the bridge defenders and faced those on the river bank. It was as I stabbed a surprised warrior in the face with Saxon Slayer that I heard first a mighty crack like thunder, and then screams. Faramir shouted, The bridge has collapsed. We are alone. It would do little good to bemoan our position. The Norns had spun and the bridge had been old. My leadership was being tested. The Saxons saw that they had the wolves surrounded and they began to close with us. Without turning, I shouted, We are the men of Ayrhon and we do not fear these Saxons. Hold the formation and trust in each other. I might have had more words to say, but the Saxons rushed us in an attempt to drive us into a river which, although I could not see it, must have been filled with the drowning bodies of men who were mailed. Were my foster father and cousins dead? Had the princeling Canute survived? The thoughts flashed through my mind for a heartbeat, and then my battle instincts took over. I thrust Saxon Slayer at the eager warrior whose own spear was shorter than mine. Gunhild had found a good stand of ash that day, and the spearhead drove into the man's chest, and I turned the head and dragged his dying body to the side. The ones following fell over his corpse, and as they did so I withdrew my spear and stabbed down again on the unprotected back of one of the fallen. A Saxon spear struck my shield, a second my helmet, but the straps on both held and I punched with the shield as I stabbed another of the writhing bodies on the ground. I now had a wall of four bodies before me as Leif had managed to spear one too. It made the enemy move to my right. They were surrounding us, but on our right they faced spears and they would die. The ones on our left had shields before them and spears which jabbed over the top. I heard Lodvir's voice behind me. I had no idea where he was, but hearing it told me that he was alive. Use the dead as a bridge. That is Sven Saxon Slayer and our best warriors fighting for their lives. It heartened me that help was coming, and I gripped my shield a little tighter. If we were to die, then we would die hard. We would enable our men to win the battle. 
I heard a thane exhorting his men to push us back into the river and saw five mailed men, two of them wielding axes, lead a small mob of farmers to run directly at me. They could not have seen the bodies or else they would have angled their attack to my left. The swinging axes looked dangerous, but I had faced one before at Dean. With my left foot planted before me, I slightly raised my shield as I tried to work out where the axe would strike, and then Saxon Slayer darted out as I saw that his bernie's fastenings had not been tied tightly, and I spied cloth. The tip drove into his breastbone, and then the spearhead cracked it open and entered his body. His axe fell, and he lurched to the side, dragging his body from Saxon Slayer. The second axe-man had been swinging his own axe at me, and the falling warrior deflected his axe so that it struck my shield a glancing blow. His momentum and the weight of those behind him made him an easy target for Lars, whose spear skewered him. The thane and his other two mailed housecarls had swords, and they closed with us. The men behind the thane told me that Saxon Slayer was no longer the weapon I needed. As the thane and one of the housecarls closed with me, I punched with my shield and then stabbed Saxon Slayer to pin the housecarl's foot to the ground. He screamed in pain, and that allowed me to draw Oath Sword. Behind me, I heard Gandalf shout, Oath Sword! I knew it would give heart to my men. I smashed the hilt into the face of the thane as my shield took the strike from his sword. I then used the pommel to strike into the side of the head of the pinioned housecarl. He tried to raise his sword, but Oath Sword's freshly sharpened edge slid down and across his neck. The spurting blood showered the thane and me as Lars used his own sword to kill the last housecarl. I lifted my shield sharply, and the metal rim smashed up and under the chin of the thane. Ah, Yehan! Lodvir's voice and the sudden pressure in my back of Leif's shield told me that men had made the south bank of the river. We were no longer just hanging on. Now we needed to move. The thane's head jerked back, and I knew that I had hurt him. He had a male burney, but I had Oath's sword, and I drove the tip towards him as I stepped onto my right foot. It was not just the strength of my right arm that helped Oath's sword slide through mail and into flesh. It was also the weight of the men behind me, as not only the thane was driven back, but also the mob of men who were behind him. We were mailed, and they were not. The falling thane was like the bursting of a dam. We moved forward with such speed that it felt like we were back at Eirhorn on the training ground and charging invisible enemies. The farmers we faced were not prepared to face the metal demons who had just slaughtered their lord and his oath sworn. They broke, and when they did, so I saw that we had broken through their whole army. As they fled south, I raised oath sword and shouted, Turn! I whirled left and saw the Saxons hurriedly trying to turn and face the sudden threat we posed. I knew that there would be others behind me doing the same, but I had heard Lodvia's voice. He would deal with those. Karl Three Fingers warriors who wore no mail had already crossed the river and were engaging the Saxons on the river bank. I knew what we had to do. I risked looking behind me and I saw that I had a wedge of twenty men. More were joining me and I saw the backs of the others that told me Lodvir was doing as I had done and clearing the other side of the river bank. When I spied my foster father, cousins and Canute clambering up from the remains of the bridge, then I knew that the Allfather wished us to win. I raised oath sword and pointed it at the Saxons who were trying to form a shield wall, but one without mailed warriors. One more charge, and we will end this. Let us tell them who we are. I began to sing, and not only my wedge but the rest of the clan sang too. It gave us the rhythm and the beat. We marched quickly towards the shield wall. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend, our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. We are the bird you cannot find, with feathers grey and black behind. Seek us if you can, my friend, our clan will beat you in the end. Where is the bird? In the snake. The serpent comes your gold to take. We charged into spears but some spears were just fire-hardened points, and even the ones which had metal heads were not particularly sharp. 
My shield shattered the first, too, and even the metal one which scratched across my shoulder did no harm. Oath sword, in contrast, smashed into the helmet and then the skull of the first Saxon, and my shield brushed aside the man to his right. I pulled back my arm and drove Oathsward towards the terrified face of the next Saxon, who brought his shield up in an attempt to save himself. His spear was thrust blindly at my head, and I easily avoided the clumsy strike. The shield stopped my sword from finding flesh, but it found the crack in the boards and split the shield in two. The boss of my shield struck him in the face, and with a shattered nose his body fell to the ground and I trampled across it as we moved deep into the hastily formed Saxon defences. There was an Erlardman, and he was mounted on a horse, no doubt to give him a better view of the battle. He must have not liked what he saw, for I saw him point to the south and then give a command. The words were lost, for he was four hundred paces from me, but the meaning became clear as those closest to him joined him as they fled south and east. I stabbed another Saxon as the ones behind him turned and saw that they were fleeing. They joined the rout, and within four swings of oath sword, the Saxons were gone. We could not have chased them, even had we wanted to, for we were all weary beyond words, and besides, we had done all that was asked of us. King Swain and the bulk of the mailed portion of our army still stood on the north bank of the river. They had not yet crossed. The only mailed men who had managed to cross were those of Ripa and Ayrhorn. I turned to my wedge. I saw that young Thorkel was no longer there. I had lost one of my men. That made me sad, but I realised that it could have been worse. Thorkel was one who had not fought in the wedge but the shield wall behind it. He had been unlucky, for the rest, Faramir, Gandalfer and the rest, were still whole. Their mail was bloodied, and some had cuts, but they stood. It was an honour to lead you this day. I raised my sword in salute, and they all shouted, Oath sword! Now, let us reap our reward before the men of Hedderbir find the courage to cross the river and take the mail from the warriors we slew. They cheered again, and before someone takes Saxon Slayer. I had just retrieved my spear from the foot of the dead house carl when my foster father, limping and supported by my cousins, found me. What happened? The bridge collapsed and we found ourselves in the river. It was not as deep as we had thought, but I managed to turn my ankle as we fell. We climbed out of the river using the Saxon dead and the wooden piles. We followed Lodvir. You have the honour of the victory, foster son. Swain one eye nodded. Aye, that was worthy of a saga. Twenty of you faced a Saxon army, and you won. I looked around. And where is Canute? Hawk laughed. He went to chastise his father for being so tardy. He urged us to get to your side, and when the Saxons fled, his face was filled with anger that his father's men had not done what we did. We did what we were asked. A man cannot be responsible for the actions of others. The Norns spun, and we have another victory. My men have mail, and the battle made us closer. Thank you, Foster Father, for giving me the chance to lead. It is in your blood, and you did not disappoint. Now you will have every young warrior clamouring to join you. We reached our ships a week later, having left a trail of destruction as we headed south. We had destroyed the only army the Saxons had, and their churches, monasteries and nunneries were emptied of all that they contained. We even halted at Wintoncester to taunt the Saxons who were waiting terrified behind the walls of the mightiest burr in England. When we reached White, the king sent for me and presented me with a beautifully made jewel-encrusted dagger. Too pretty to use, it was a symbol, and showed that my star had risen. The king planned on wintering on the island, but at the end of Morsugur, King Ethelred sent an envoy. He had endured enough, and we were paid thirty thousand pounds in weight of gold to leave his land. We reached Ayahon by the end of Thorri. We were all richer. Chapter 13 1007. Ayrhon 
The ships we had sent home had kept our people well fed over the winter, and now they provided another source of income as the Jarl sold most of them to Axel the Swede. They were sound ships, and added to the growing fleet the Swede owned. We kept one, for we saw the opportunity to trade two. We benefited from the profits. The Swede also asked if he could hire some of the younger warriors to act as guards for his ships. Swain saw no problem with that, as it would keep them occupied when they were not needed by the clan, and give them experience. There were pirates, but a handful of armed Danes were often enough discouragement to make them choose easier prey. I came home, as did many other men, to a son. This time Mary had named him Bersi, after my father. He had already been christened by the time I saw him. Gunhild and Steyana had also grown, and were now clearly children. I even understood much of what Steyana had to say. I looked forward to some weeks of their company before the demands of the clan and my lands took over. Mary was delighted that we would not be raiding, and another year of peace loomed up. Canute spent more time with me. He accepted that I needed to be with my children, and I could not resume his training yet, but he was full of questions, both about Oathsword and, surprisingly, Mary. I knew that he admired her, for she was both clever and well-read. He had always spoken to her when they had met, and he had, especially when he had been younger, rained questions on her. Now he asked me about her and her background. I had no idea why he wished the information, but I found it easy to talk to him about the woman I loved and the mother of my children. She had been my mother's crutch through her last years, and, I believe, kept her alive long after she should have died. He also asked Mary directly about some of the names of the people we had heard while raiding. Some were totally unknown to her. Edric Streona, for example, but others like Elfhelm and Uhtred the Bold, both lords of Northumbria, were the names of men she knew. It was while we were talking that I asked him about his relationship with his younger brother. It had become clear while we had been raiding that King Swain saw Harold as his heir, and I wondered if Canute resented that. It might explain his questions. I know that my stepmother has bewitched my father, and no matter what I do in battle, my younger brother will still be king of Denmark. I am resigned to that. But England? That is a different matter. Your wife is from that land, and she does not see Ethelred as a worthy king. From the way the Saxons failed to fight with any determination, I am inclined to agree. Do not forget Ulfchettel. I do not, and I see him as a serious threat but he is out of favour with their king, and that is surprising, for he almost defeated us. I see these raids to England as a way to take their land. I would have my father stay there longer to raid. When I am old enough, I will ask if I can lead an army there. You are a warrior now. He laughed. A warrior who has yet to kill? That will come, and I will gain the skills I need, but I do not plan for this year or even the next. I see far into the future, and you, Sven Saxonsword, will be the key to my success. His laughter was infectious, as were his fanciful ideas, which had as much chance of coming to fruition as I had of becoming an archbishop. I am just a herseer from Eierhorn. I am content. He nodded. But I am not. I put his words from my mind, for they seemed like one of Swain's sagas not based on the real world, but a warped vision, a stylized telling of a tale with a few pieces of reality thrown in. I threw myself into the task of training men, playing with my children, and watching my land prosper. When in the summer Canute left us to return to his father, I thought we had seen the last of the engaging princeling. I saw that he was as ambitious as his father. Swain one eyes son, Swain, had been training with us for some time. A little older than Canute, he was now ready to join the shield wall, and when we began to train the new warriors I saw the nervousness from my cousin. He knew the pressure to be a successful warrior, and as the grandson of the Jarl he had much to live up to. Griotard no longer helped us to train the young warriors. He had become a captain and enjoyed that. 
It meant we were the ones moulding the young men, and my cousin normally deferred to me. The two new Hathweru just kept quiet. They had been trained by me not so long ago. Some of those who farmed my land, like Gandalfa and Faramir, often joined us. The work on their land was not arduous, and both had thralls. It was useful to have them, for it meant we could demonstrate our formations easier. A wedge with three men rarely worked. Swain Swainson proved to be one of the most gifted warriors I had yet seen. He was at least the equal of Dreng and Snorri. Perhaps he had inherited the skill from his grandfather, for his father had never been the greatest swordsman. When we used the wooden swords, he could soon best all the other new warriors, and gave Dreng and Snorri a hard time. As we watched them, I said to my cousin, Your son has skills which will soon put him in the forefront of a shield wall. Are you happy about that? He smiled. We both know that is out of our hands. He has been given skills, and it would be wrong to deny him the chance to use those skills. Of course, his mother will not wish it, but that is in the nature of mothers. Hawk occasionally visited, and when he did, he helped us. He had become wiser since he had married. The odds on his death are less than they would be in another crew. We both looked at him. I know not if it is your skill, cousin, or the magic of Orthsword, but we lose few men, do we not? Even when the bridge collapsed we did not lose many warriors. We were silent as we took that in, and then a thought struck me. You will need to curb, cousin, any tendency to seek glory. Remember the Jarl who died in Hamthenskir? They both nodded. They were a good warband, but one man's desire for glory and recklessness caused a whole crew to perish. Swain One-Eye changed that day. He became his son's guide and mentor. I still showed him how to use weapons, but his father taught him how to use his greatest weapon. His mind. It was after the harvest and the blutfeast that Knut returned. He rode a fine horse and was now dressed as a prince of Denmark. He had his hair trimmed and his beard and moustache had been shaved. He looked even younger than I remembered, but he did look more like a prince. He had with him six warriors, and I saw their Herkumbul. They were his Hathweru. His father had accepted him as a leader. The training in Ayarhon had been worth while, and we had made a man of the boy. I did not know if we would reap any benefit from the work we had done, but I had a deep sense of satisfaction, for I would happily fight alongside the princeling, and that said much. He and his men dismounted. Welcome, Knut. You are now a warrior with Hathweru. My father said I needed Hathweru, and he chose these six from his own oath sworn. They will do for now. Knut was unafraid of upsetting people, and he spoke loudly enough for the six to hear him. I had seen that when he had spoken to his father and refused the chance to go to Thetford. He knew his own mind. And now you are returned. I wanted to know why they had come back, for I did not think it was in the nature of Knut to come and show off his fine clothes, horse, weapons, and hearthweru. I have come because my father wishes to speak to you, and I must ask a favour of Jarl Swain Skulltaker. My heart sank, for I did not wish to travel back to head the beard, and yet, as the king had requested it, I could not refuse. Of course, I take it that we would be leaving soon. On the morrow. Then, while you have a conference with our foster father, I will speak to Mary. Mary was more intrigued than upset. And he wants just you. Perhaps it is the sword he wants. Perhaps, but he said he had to speak to the Jarl. I shrugged. We will find out soon enough, I dare say. When no one came to speak to me before I retired for the night, I was a little concerned. Was there a problem? I had expected the Jarl, at least, to tell me what this was about. I rose early and prepared my horse. Magnus was an indulgence, for I did not need a horse 
but when I had seen him for sale in the market at Riba, I had to have him, for he was pure black except for a white blaze in the centre of his head. This would be my first long ride with him, and I looked at the horn of ale as half full. Whatever the outcome of the meeting, I would enjoy the ride. Jarl Swain and Swain One-Eye came with Canute and his oath sworn. The Jarl said almost apologetically, I would have come to speak last night, but we feasted and talked until late. It is of no matter, Jarl. There was a question in my eyes, if not my words. King Swain has need of Ayahona's greatest warrior, and Canute asked my permission. He smiled. I believe that the task which you will undertake must be worth while. He turned and looked pointedly at Canute. Jarl, the task was requested by me, but my father insists that he speaks with Sven Saxon Sword first. He will return, I promise, and it will be soon. I was even more intrigued, for Canute would not be profligate with my life. The king might, but not, I believed, his son. As we rode, with six men twenty paces behind us, Canute said, I will let my father tell you the task, for he ordered me to remain silent. I need this to succeed, and so I agreed. I am sorry that it is such a mystery. It need not be, but it is my father's way. I would be more open, but... I nodded. The six men who protect you. You trust them? He frowned. My father chose them. That is not what I asked. If you had the choice, would you have chosen them? The question sank in, and he shook his head and said quietly, I do not think so. Then appoint your own as soon as you can. You know that the men in my wedge all chose to follow me. They are not Hathweru, but I trust them like my family. When we fought on the Kennet, I knew that I could rely on them, and they helped us to win. That is what you need, my young friend. Then I will begin to seek out those that I think could be trustworthy. Over the next miles, I told him how to choose men he could trust. The six behind us were undoubtedly good warriors. They had battle bands and scars. Their mail and weapons were the best. But those who protected needed good hearts and a desire to protect their charge. I knew that when they discovered what I had said, the six men might become my enemies. I did not mind, for I owed Canute, and I knew not them. On the other hand, they might resent having to serve the princeling when they were the king's hearthweru. King Swain had used the coins we had been paid well, and his hall was the most palatial I had ever seen. It was some years since I had been here, but I could see that he had paid workmen to gild some of the wood with gold and silver. The cross which adorned the top was also well carved and inlaid with silver. To the world he seemed like a Christian king but I knew the reality, and this was just for show. He had shown when we had raided crueler traits than any barbarian. As we entered the huge gates manned by warriors in gleaming mail, Canute said, You will be staying for at least one night, Sven. He said it almost apologetically, but I had known that I would have to. I determined that I would drink as little as possible. I dared not give offence but I would not succumb to the drunkenness which had once left me so ill. There were stables with grooms for our horses, and I watched the one who attended to Magnus. He seemed to know what he was doing, and after patting his neck, I followed Canute into the hall. It was filled with warriors, and they were drinking ale and mead. It was a loud and raucous gathering, and that surprised me, for I thought King Swain would try to appear more regal. His wife was well named. Siegfried the Haughty. She seemed to permanently look down her nose, which was already raised so high as to make me wonder what she could actually see. My lady, this is Sven Saxonsword. She barely glanced at me and sniffed. He does not smell as bad as some of the other warriors here. That was the sum of her words to me, and she never spoke to me again. King Swain smiled. You are a warrior, Sven Saxon Sword, and I would not have you smell any other way. First we eat and drink. Tomorrow, when time allows and we have clear heads, then I will speak with you. 
I saw that Carl Three Fingers and Thorkel the Tall were seated close to the king. Carl waved at me and then resumed his conversation with Thorkel. The food was good. For living on the eastern side of Denmark, the king had a greater choice of animals and fish. We were served beaver tail, and I found it delicious. We had no beaver near to us, and this must have come from the Frankish Empire. The ale and mead were good, too, but any warrior will tell you that the best ale and mead come from his own hall. Canute kept me apprised of who the warriors were that we saw. That he knew them and their skills impressed me. When he was a leader, such observations could make all the difference. When men began to fall over drunk, and after Siegfried the Haughty had retired, men began to fight. Canute and I slipped away to the hall where we would sleep. As most of the men were still in the mead hall, we were amongst the first in, and we chose two fur-lined beds in the corner, away from the doors. When the latecomers staggered in, then anyone close to the door risked being stepped upon. It was not the best night's sleep I had ever had, for there were too many men in the hall. I was used to my quiet hall. Even when we raided we did not have to endure such a cacophony of noise. I could understand why so many drank themselves to oblivion. I was amongst the first to rise, and I went into the fresh air just so that I could breathe. I was reluctant to enter a mead hall I knew would stink of urine and vomit. The doors were open, and the thralls were busy cleaning it. Instead, I walked the walls of the town, for this was a fortress. Had it been in England, then it would have been called a burr, but it was far stronger than even Wintoncester. I knew that I was recognised, for some of the sentries must have been at Svolder, or raided with us, and they spoke to me. Of course, while their words were addressed to me, their eyes stared at Oathsword. It was pleasant speaking to them, for these were real warriors, and they were keen to speak of Dean, Exeter, Svolder, and Northwick. Canute ended my walk, for he waved to me, and I descended. My father wishes to speak, Sven. Good, for I am intrigued. All you need to know is that this idea came from me, and it was I asked for you. Then you stir more intrigue and mystery to this interesting pot. We did not enter the mead hall. Obviously King Swain had the same aversion to the smell as I did. Instead, Canute led me to a small, more intimate hall closer to where he and his family lived. Carl Three Fingers was there with the king, but that was all. Food and ale were on a side table. The king waved a hand. Take what you will and then sit. The servants will be leaving us. This was private. That much was clear. There were no guards and no hearthwareu. I picked some fried salted pig meat, pickled cabbage and rye bread which I placed on a wooden platter. I poured myself some ale and sat. The others had already taken their food. The king began without preamble. The time you have spent with my son appears to have made his mind sharper. For that I thank you. He is now a man and a warrior. He has come up with an idea in which I find merit. He suddenly stopped eating and jabbed his eating knife towards me. What is said here remains a secret. You will not reveal a single word. Do you understand? His voice was harsh and commanding. I did not like his tone. I put down my own knife and said, King Swain, I did not choose to come here. I was summoned. I do not appreciate being spoken to as though I am a thrall and threatened with a knife. I am happy to go back to Eirhorn and continue my life there. I saw Karl cover his smile with a hand. The king looked shocked, and Canute said, Father, I trust Sven Saxon Sword. He has shown that he is a true warrior, and has fought for you too many times to be disparaged so. The king shook his head. This is your plan, Canute, and I hope you have chosen your man well. To me he still seems a little young. You can speak, and I will eat and watch. His eyes glared at me. Canute smiled and nodded. You remember that elf helm of Jorvik was murdered? I nodded. 
he was not only an earlman of Northumbria, but through his mother was related to Elfiad, who was the brother of Athelstan. I was intrigued. Related? How? Canute became irritated and waved an airy hand. Elfhem of Yorick's grandmother claimed to have slept with Elfweard before he was murdered. That sounded so vague that it was unlikely that Elfhelm would have believed he had any claim at all to the crown. For all Ethelred's faults, and there were many, he was the rightful king of England. I just said, Ah! King Ethelred must believe the story, for he has had the daughter of the murdered man, Elf Gifu, imprisoned in a hall along a tributary of the Humber. Thurbrand the Hold is the lord of that part of the land, and he has many men guarding her. He paused. I propose to rescue her and bring her here to Heatherbeer. She will be kept safe, and when we deem the time to be right, I shall marry her. I was shocked by the audacity of the plan, but I saw it all clearly now. He wanted a crown, and this was a way for him to give himself some legitimacy. Harold might have Denmark, but Canute saw a richer prize. England. I have spoken with Jarl Svein, and he has agreed to let us use one of the trading ships we took at Standwick. He only knows that I wish you to sail with me to England and take your band of warriors. The clan will be recompensed for your time away. We do not need a large crew. It will be your wedge who will crew, and we have the man whom Axel loaned us when we raided, Edgar. He has agreed to steer. I felt myself becoming angry. I had thought better of Canute, and that I had raised a good man. He was happy to use my warriors and me to get his own ends. And none of us have any say in the matter? King Swain's eyes narrowed. Did my son not make it clear? A Yehorna and a Ribba will be paid for this raid. You will be doing it not as a Danish warrior, but as a pirate. We have taken Ethelred's coin, and I will not break the agreement. King Swain, they will know we are Danish. Carl Threefingers spoke for the first time. Perhaps not for even now the ship is being disguised with a new sail bearing a Norse design. They will think that you are disgruntled Norsemen. The planning was incredible. My foster father must have known more than he let on. Why was he going along with this? And if my men say no? Canute gave me a sad smile. We both know that they will not. It was another reason for choosing you. Your men are loyal to you. And I bear oath sword. I am Sven Saxon's sword, and every Viking knows that. But not the men of Northumbria and Holderness. They have never even heard of you. We slip up the River Humber for eight miles and sail a little way up the River Hull. We cross just a mile to the hall and the tower. The Lady Elfgifu has just two serving women, and all the rest are men from the retinue of Turbrand the Hold, the Lord of Holderness. He does not live there, but he has his warriors guarding her. I pushed away the platter, for I had lost my appetite. I drank the beer, but it tasted sour. I had thought to have a year free from war, and instead I would be risking not only my own life, but the young warriors who followed me, not to mention Lodvia's ship all for a wild plan which would not, so far as I could see, get Canute anything. The abduction of a Saxon lady by Vikings would add fuel to the argument that we were all barbarians. They would not see fine motives. I have no choice in the matter? King Swain said flatly, Your Jarl has agreed. He smiled. It is not just the money we have paid. Axel the Swede has been granted trading rights here in Hedebir. Your foster father understands the way the world works. Your clan will all reap the benefits. This was not the place to argue. I would save those for Eirholm. I rose. Then if you have done with me, I had better head back to my home. I have much to do. The king's hand dismissed me, and I left. Canute scurried after me. Sven, do not be angry. I thought you would have been pleased for me. I plan for the future. 
and if things go awry then there will be no future for the young warriors I trained. I strode to the stables and he had to run to keep up with me. As I saddled Magnus, he said, I will be at Riba in five days. I will meet you at the ship. That gave me five days to persuade Jarl Swain to cease giving his support to this ridiculous notion. If we needed more coins, then we could raid Frankia. When I reached my home, I went directly to the hall of Swain's skulltaker. Far from dissipating my anger, it had grown all the way back to Ayrhona, and when I strode into the hall, I was seething. My foster father must have been warned of my approach, for the hall was empty, and my feet echoed on the wooden floor. Swain approached me and said, You are angry. His voice was calm, and I nodded, but before I could speak, the words were a torrent in my head and ready to pour out and drown him. He said, And you are right to be angry. Let me speak, and then if your anger has not left your face, your heart and your mind, then we can send a message to Canute and tell him that we will not do as he asks. He gestured to the table. Come, let us sit. Is your horse outside? Aye. Volky, take Sven Saxon Sword's horse to his stable. A disembodied from outside the hall said, Aye, Jarl. There is no need for your horse to suffer for your anger. We sat. What you are asked to do is a good thing. You and I are not Christians, but your wife would applaud what you do. Elf Gifu is young and not yet a woman. Ethelred has shown that he is a cruel man. The warrior who holds her, Thurbrand the Hold, is a dangerous and ambitious man. He is the Edric of the North. How do you know all this? I checked Knut's words. Now that more ships visit us, I was able to go to the port yesterday and ask the captains. I did so discreetly, implying that we sought to trade. It was the Saxon traders who confirmed that Elfgifu was being held against her will. Her father was popular, and there is sympathy for the maid. It is another reason for Knut's decision. He seeks to use that support when the time is right. He will be the man who saved the maiden. That still does not give a reason why it should be you who goes. The reason is you. Canute admires you. He watched you closely when you trained him, and he followed you to war. While the rest of us were fighting alongside you, he was watching. He wants this to succeed, and he believes that you are the only man who gives his plan a chance. But the other warriors, why should they take a risk? He laughed, for the same reason. They chose to follow you. When I made you and my son's hearth, Weru, I did not give you a choice. I like to think that you did not mind, but there was no choice for you. Gandalfer, Lars, all of them chose to fight alongside you. I offered some the chance to be my hearth, Weru, with Dreng and Snorri. They chose you. I was silent and somewhat humbled. Swain said in a quiet voice, Now that you are calm, and no longer thinking that you have been used as a piece in a chess game, ask yourself, do you think that you can succeed? Be honest with yourself. Do you have the skills to lead men through hostile land and effect the rescue of one who is little more than a girl? Can you do that and return here to Ayahorn? I sighed and closed my eyes. My foster father said, You are not like your father in this respect, Sven. He would not have hesitated, but he would have taken his drecker and a full crew and he would have charged him without any thought to survival. That was his way. You are more like your mother. You are thoughtful. You have your father's courage, but you have much of your mother's mind and heart in you. I opened my eyes and knew that he was right. I did think, perhaps too much. Sailing a trading ship will mean that we should escape notice. We will have to disguise the large crew in some way. Perhaps we could board the ship at night. I realised that I had accepted the idea and was already planning it. My foster father was a clever man. If we land at dusk, it will give us the chance to scout out the hall and then attack when all save the sentries who watch her are asleep. 
The hard part, if we succeed in persuading her to come with us, will be timing the tide and dawn so that we evade notice. I do not know this river Hull, nor the Humber, and there may be ships belonging to this Thurbrand the Hold. We cannot outrun a Saxon warship. He nodded. Then it could be done. Remember, Sven, that Knut will be with you. He is risking his own life, and that says much about the young man. He wants to make sure that he has power when he gets older, and he is planning now. He is not sitting idly by and hoping that the Norns spin him a good future. Personally, I do not think that marrying this girl at some point in the future will help him to gain the crown. The story he has heard is too thin. But that matters not to Canute. He's taken the future into his hands. It is a gamble, but one I can understand. I liked Canute before this, but now I am not so sure. You remember your first raid when you roared with Snorri? I nodded. You liked him? I still do. Yet he chose not to become a warrior and now raise his pigs. That was his choice. He's different from me. If we were all the same, it would be a dull world. Canute is different from you. Look into your heart and ask yourself, has he changed? Or did you have an idea of a perfect prince who might become a perfect king? Even as he said the words, I knew that he had read my mind. You are right. I suppose now I will have to tell Mary what it is I do. She will not be happy. He nodded. One more thing I need to tell you. I know you were angry with me because I agreed. You thought I was bought off or bullied by threats. Neither is true. I only took the coins after I had agreed. I think Canute will be a good king, for Harold has been influenced too much by his mother and is like his father, ruthless. Canute has a ruthless streak too, but he is also honest, and his motives are good. My grandson Swain will be on the ship with you. He overheard the conversation and said he wished to sail with his uncle. If I thought it you would fail, would I let my eldest grandchild go with you? I left the hall with a mind filled with so much that I thought it would burst. I needed to speak to Mary. Chapter 14 The return of my horse had alerted Mary. She's a Christian and can have not a drop of vulva blood in her, but sometimes she knows things that she cannot know. As I approached, my two eldest ran to me and I swept them up in my arms. They both babbled about presents and I felt guilty that I had not brought any. Then they asked to play with me and it confirmed in my head that I did not need this risk for a future king's desire. Children, go and prepare for food. Anna, take them to wash. Your father will put you to bed tonight and tell you stories, but first I need to speak to him alone. My wife had a firm voice which brooked no argument, and the four of them left without complaint. Sit and tell me all. Mary poured me some ale. I know that there is something going on. Agnetta came yesterday to speak to me, and she rarely visits. Others have been arriving to speak to me. I thought that you had been summoned to the king for punishment, and I was relieved when you returned whole. But tell me so that my mind can become at peace once more. I swallowed some of the beer and then began. I told her of the task, and then of my misgivings, and how I had thought to confront my foster father. Finally I told her that I believed I would have to do this. When I had finished, and it took less time than I had thought, she smiled and took my hand in hers. That you worry about the lives of others rather than your own is one reason I love you so much. In all your words you never said that you were afraid or that you might die. It was a concern for the men you lead. This is a dangerous thing you do. I have heard of this Thurbrand. His family are ruthless. When I read the parchments to your mother, his family name was mentioned, and it made me afraid. Now I know that you risk meeting him, I am even more fearful. Swain Skulltaker is right. The only chance for Elfgifu is you. One young girl may seem unimportant, 
and if she died, then the world might not even miss her. But I am a Christian and know that every life is important. What happened to her family was inexcusable. If this was Gunhild, would you want her held against her will expecting death or worse when she went to bed each night? Mary's words were like a dagger to my heart. I would fight all the demons of her God's hell to save my daughter. I kissed my wife's hand. You are right. Thank you. God sent a good man to take me from my home. When I think of the warriors who could have taken me, I wake shivering and shaking. You are still, despite my efforts, a pagan, but one day you will see the Christian who lies within your heart. The next morning I began to assemble my crew. I approached each one individually so that I could explain the dangers and that there was no expectation from me that they would go with me. To my amazement, all wished to sail with me. I had sixteen men and I stopped at that number. More would have been useful if we found ourselves facing many enemies, but sixteen would be a reasonable number for the crew of a large trader. Swain Swainson would be the ship's boy, and that left the helmsman, Edgar. He still worked for Axel, but he had taken a Danish wife and he lived in Reba. He was keen to sail with us, despite the danger. I discovered the reason within the first moments of speaking to him. He had been promised that he could captain the trader we used. It belonged to Canute, for his father had given it to him, and Edgar knew the profits he could make. He also knew the two rivers, and that convinced me. We had a crew, but the motives of all of us were different. I think that I was the only one sailing to rescue a young girl. Canute hoped to win a crown, Edgar a boat, and the rest did it out of duty to me. When Canute arrived in Riba, we sailed the trader Ravenswing down to Ayerhon. Our original plan to load the ship at night had long been abandoned for the whole village knew that we would sail west. They did not know where we sailed, but as it was warriors they all assumed that we were raiding. To maintain the illusion that we were traders we would not be taking either shields or spears. Our mail would be kept below the deck in the capacious hold. We would wear beaver skin and seal skin hats and simple kirtles. Half of the crew would stay hidden beneath the gunwale if we closed with any other ship, and we had some almost empty barrels of pickled herring and salted meat on the deck to add to the deception. We left at the start of Illyr. The days were getting shorter, and that would help, but at the same time it added to the danger as we would be sailing at night. There would be fewer ships on the sea, and that too would help. When we landed, we would have more darkness to help us. The last night was spent in my thrall hall when we went over everything we planned. Swain Skulltaker had mounted a guard on our ship so that Edgar and Swain could attend. I spoke and made certain that I could see the eyes of all. The voyage will take four or five days and nights. We will have three watches and that means two-thirds will be sleeping or be hidden. That is intentional. I lead. I looked at Canute, who nodded. That means that if I think we cannot succeed, then I will abort the mission and no one shall argue. They all nodded. Edgar, the river and the hall? Edgar answered confidently. The river Humber is as wide as a sea, but the entrance has a shifting sandbank called Spurn Head, but once we have navigated that, the Humber is easy. The hull can be tricky. But as we have no cargo, then Raven's wing will ride higher in the water, and the shallow waters will not hurt us. Indeed, if we are pursued, when we escape, then the enemy will be more likely to fall foul of them. Pursued? Yes, Sven Saxon sword. Thurbrand has his own warships. They are on the Humber, but if word gets out, he can send them after us. He shrugged. It is a risk, and there is no getting around that. I nodded. The hall has a stone tower attached. I think that one of Thurbrand's ancestors built it from the stone of a Roman signal tower. It is not high, but it gives a good view during the day over the flatlands that surround the hall. 
There is no ditch, and the hall is similar to this one. The warriors and the captives will all live in the hall. Thralls? Aye, there are thralls, and at night they are locked in a thrall hall. Locking thralls at night was a normal procedure. Gandalf asked, How do you know so much about this place, Edgar? When I was young, I sailed on a ship from Yulvik to Londonwick. I travelled the river each month, and the all can be clearly seen. It is the last home you see before you reach the open sea, and I was young and curious. I last saw it five years ago, but I cannot see that they will have changed it much. He paused. They might have. I do not know. And that is why we land when the sun has set and we have darkness to scout out the land. Before you ask, we do not know how many men guard the captives. It is a maid and two servants. It could be just six men, but equally it is a large hall and it could be a crew of a ship. We might have twenty or thirty men to face. I wanted none to be complacent. We will take bows with us, for some of you are good archers and an arrow is silent. It will not be honourable work. My Sayaks and Norse gutter are more likely to be used than oath sword. We cannot spare any of the guards. If the alarm is given, we cannot fight off a warship. There was an hour or so of questions, and then they all retired. Edgar and Swain went to the Drekker, and my men returned to their families. I went to watch my children sleeping. Mary came to slip her arm through mine. All will be well, and this is more honourable than raiding nunneries, is it not? Perhaps. I was still unconvinced. The next morning I was at the ship early. It was moored at the furthest end of the quay and the least popular berth. We had decided to have the men join us in pairs. There were other ships in the port, and we could not control them. I was trying to make my men almost disappear while walking to the ship. We had decided to sail without fuss, and so none came to see us off. We had said our farewells in our halls. We all looked like sailors rather than warriors. We had brought our weapons the previous night, and our mail had been stored for a couple of days in the hold. We loaded the barrels, and as the last of the crew boarded, we set sail. We were advised by Edgar, who told us what to do. The ships we passed saw just five of us, for the rest were hidden from view by the barrels which would be our disguise. We headed north for the simple reason that we spied no ships, and any of the ones in Eirhon that had seen us leave would assume we headed to Norway or Östersund. It was also the natural way to go around the offshore islands. Once we had an empty horizon, we turned to head west, and with Swain as the lookout, the crew were able to stand. The time of year ensured that the sea was empty. Winter was not the time to sail. The wind was fresh and helped us, but also brought squally rain. That too helped as it made the visibility poor. After the speed of a drecker, the tubby cargo ship seemed to barely move. It would take a long time to reach Holderness. I mentioned this to Canute and Edgar. Edgar smiled. We do not reef the sail at night, for there are few ships, and we do not travel fast enough. With a good watch, then any danger can be spotted. We keep the same speed, no matter what the time of day. Slow and steady, that is the way of the trader. He was proved right. I took one of the watches while Edgar slept. It was unnerving to sail into the dark. Until dawn we would not know if we were on course or not, but Edgar had given me some tips on how to steer without the stars. By keeping the forestays and the mast in line with the short prow, it was possible to sail in a relatively straight line. It meant we lost a little speed when the wind changed, but that was acceptable. I woke Edgar, who took the rest of the night watch. When we woke to a cold but bright day, then he had another sleep once he had checked the compass and put us on the right course. We had not deviated by much. We saw not a single ship that day. Laras and Leif were happy to steer, and with four of us sharing the steering board, none were overtired. Canute was quieter than I had expected. 
With little experience of sailing a ship, he was not given the steering board, but he stood his watches with the rest of us. Here he had no opportunity to be pampered. His hearthwaru had been left with his father. That had been my decision. This would be hard enough without having men I did not know with me. I had trained all the men with me, with the exception of the brothers Lars and Leif. I had fought alongside them since before I found Oath's sword. As Canute and I watched the smudge that was England approach, and we took in the sail a little so that Edgar could find the estuary, I asked him about our quest. And what if the girl does not wish to come? I waved an arm at my men. To a maid, these will look worse than Thurbrand's guards. Canute smiled and gestured to his face. Before I returned to my father, with the idea still growing in my head, I asked Mary what she found so attractive in you when you took her by force. She told me you looked less threatening because you were clean-shaven. I laughed. I barely had a whisker in those days. The times I have spent with your wife and your children's nurse has improved my words and enabled me to use gentler ones than I might otherwise have. When we find her, Sven, I will see her alone and speak to her. Do not worry, Knut. We will have plenty to occupy us. So your plan is to make her like you? He nodded. Good luck with that. We may have to carry her and that can hardly be done in silence. I hope you succeed in convincing her, for the alternative may well bring down the wrath of the men of Holderness. It might be sparsely populated, but they have horses and fast ships. We are a barrel with a sail. Edgar knew the waters. He found the estuary, and I still know not how, for I did not see it. The shifting spur of sand was to me invisible, but Edgar turned us around it and then headed into the widest estuary I had seen since the Thames. We reefed the sail just to keep way, and then followed the setting sun towards the river hull. We took out the twelve oars, and the men began to row. I was taking a chance, and we would not don mail until we were closer to the hall. Swain hung over the prow, and I stood with Edgar, watching my cousin's son as he directed us away from shoals, sandbanks, and the shore. I was relieved that the river did not twist and turn as much as many other rivers I had used. I was also grateful for the lack of dwellings on the marshy shore, for when we surprised a flock of seabirds and they took off, the noise was enough to wake the dead. I regretted not making a blute. If I could, I would take one of the birds and make a sacrifice with it. The seven or eight miles we rowed seemed to take an age. Had we been in Wessex or Kent, we might have heard the tolling of a bell, but there was nothing to mark the passage of time. I could see why Ethelred had chosen such a remote place to keep his hostage to fortune. Canute had told me that the young girl might be used to make an alliance with some important warrior. The King of England was grooming the child to become marriage material. What Canute was doing was similar, but, knowing Canute as I did, I hoped that he would give her a choice. When we turned to sail up the hull, then all of us were needed, for it was narrow. In places it was just twice as wide as the ship, but Edgar was confident we would find somewhere we could turn. The wind had shifted a little in any case, and there was no room to tack. When it widened a little, and we saw to the northwest what looked like smoke, we stopped and prepared to land. The smell from the building reached us a mile before we knew where it was. A mixture of animal and human waste combined with wood smoke and cooking food, told us that we had reached our destination. We turned the ship around, and Swain and Falky tied us to the shore. Edgar said quietly, The tide is almost completely out, and explains why it took so long. If you can be back within two hours, then we have a chance of using the tide to reach the sea before dawn. The wind has already changed. I knew that because we had smelled the hall and seen the smoke before the sun set completely. I nodded. You and Swain take care. If you are disturbed and have to leave, then we will head downstream to find you. I hope it will not come to that. As do I. I was the leader, and I led. I placed Canute six men down the line of warriors, and it was Leif, Lars, Gandalf, Faramir, Ulf, and Harald who followed me. They were dependable. I had my swords and neither shield nor spear. 
I carried my helmet, for I needed my ears and my eyes. We saw the hall and the tower within half a mile of leaving the river. They stood against the western sky. I saw a glow from a door as someone came out. We were too far away to see it, but it showed me how close we were. I held my hand up and we stopped. We moved again once I saw the door open and close. When we were within a quarter of a mile we stopped, and I waved my arm for my warriors to form a half-circle and squat. My arm arrested Canute and I put him behind me. We waited and we watched. I studied the top of the tower and I saw no movement. More importantly, I saw no glow. It was cold and the wind from the northwest brought a chill to the land. Nor could I see any sentries patrolling outside. That made sense, as the girl had been here for some time. Boredom would bring complacency. None of us had moved and we were invisible. There was a building attached to the tower, but it was relatively small and I guessed it might be a sort of armory or workshop. A door to the hall opened. I saw the glow, and when a door to a second building opened to the east of the main hall, I froze. I saw movement from the main hall and people heading into the second building. When the light disappeared and I heard a bar being dropped into place, then I knew that it was the thrall hall and the slaves had been locked away for the night. As soon as the light went from the main hall, I circled my arm and spoke quietly. The wind would take my words away from the hall, but I was succinct in any case. Ulf and Harold, head around to the back of the hall and see if there is a second door. If not, then guard the door to the thrall hall. The rest, follow me. Canute, stay at the rear. This is warrior work. This was not the time for any heroics from the prince. I donned my helmet and drew oath sword and Norse gutter. This would be close and bloody work. We had not been able to ascertain numbers, and as we neared the hall I heard the sound of laughter. The Saxons were awake. We would not be able to slit throats and kill silently. We would have to rely upon surprise. As I neared the door I realised that I did not know if it was barred. If it was, then all surprise would be gone. The noise from inside was louder. It was the sound of men talking and some were laughing. I was fifteen paces away when I heard the neigh of a horse. It came from close to the single tower and I saw what had been hidden when we had spied the buildings. A small stable. Of course there would be a horse, perhaps more than one, for we were many miles from anywhere. The neighing horse must have alerted one of the guards, or it may have been that he needed to make water. As I almost reached the door, it opened, and thankfully it opened outwards, which meant I was shielded by it. The light from within would have blinded the man in any case. I waited until I saw his back, and then drove my sword up through his ribs to rip through his heart. He died without a sound. I swung his body around so that Lars could lower it to the ground. Leif stepped over the body and into the hall. I quickly followed. I saw that the men were seated around a table and drinking. Of the girl and her attendants there was no sign. That would be the task of Canute. Leif leapt towards the nearest man and the eighteen or so warriors, I did not have time to count, all looked up in surprise. Perhaps they thought that it was the man who had just left returning. Whatever the reason, the first man died at Lars's hand and I was on the second swinging oath sword across his neck. The warriors reacted quickly. I realised if I had waited longer they might have been a bed. I had not done what I had planned. The rest of my men were in the hall and we held the advantage for we had swords drawn already and they did not. Even so they were tough men and one lunged at me so quickly that even as I used oath sword to block the blow and turn, his sword slid along my mail burney damaging some of the links. I backhanded Norse gutter across his throat and he fell. Faramir was struggling to defeat a large warrior who, unlike the rest, still wore a burney. When Faramir slipped on a pool of blood, the mailed warrior raised his sword to end my young warrior's life. I brought Oath Sword across his back with such force that it sliced through mail links and into his flesh. He was a hard man and he started to turn. I used Norse gutter to end his life. Go to your god. I saw that my men were whole and the guards lay dead or dying. 
Canute, find the girl. Just then I heard the sound of hooves, and while my men looked at each other I ran from the hall and was just in time to see two men on horses galloping west. The door to the tower lay open. Ulf and Harold ran towards me. We were about to come round to the thrall, for we found no rear door when we saw the two men come from the tower and mount the horses. They saw us and fled. They did not even bother to saddle the horses. I cursed myself. Even if men could not see far from the tower, they would keep it manned. We had just been lucky that the two men had slept. Awoken by the fighting and seeing Vikings, they had fled. The Norns had been spinning, and time was now against us. Get to the ship and have Edgar prepare for sea. We will be right behind you. When I entered the hall, I saw that Canute had found the captives. He was speaking to them, and they cowered in the corner. Is anyone hurt? They shook their heads. Two men have gone for help. I know not how far away it is, but Thurbrand has ships of his own, and they are warships. We must run, Canute, now. I have explained to them what we must do, and they are content. Afraid, but content. I will come now. Turning to Lars and Leif, I said, Open the door to the thrall hall. Perhaps when they run it will confuse our pursuit. Make them run north and west. Aye, Sven. Gandalfa and Faramir help Canute. The rest of you fire the hall. I want the Saxons confused. Setting fire to the wooden building was easy. The chairs were hurled upon the fire and the rest laid close by. Even as Gandalfa and Faramir urged Canute and the three Saxons towards the door, the fire bit and the wooden chairs began to burn. As the table was thrown on top of the fire, the flames leapt higher, and soon the roof would be alight. It was Canute with Elfgifu who led us back to our drecker. Gandalfa and Faramir had slung the two women over their shoulders, but it was Elfgifu who determined our pace, and she was not quick. I saw, as we neared Ravenswing, that Edgar had the sail raised and the ship was tugging at its moorings. It was maddening to have to follow Canute and Elfgifu, who were moving too slowly. Gandalfa and Faramir reached the ship first and dumped the women in the ship. They then stood at the two lines, securing the ship to the land, and waited. Leif and Lars almost hurled Elfgifu over the side as my men scrambled aboard. I shouted, Gandalfa and Faramir, get aboard, we will cut the ropes. The seamen in them had thought to save the ropes, but I knew that the two men risked being stranded ashore. Their lives were worth more than two ropes. As soon as they were aboard, I sliced through one rope and Ulf the other. Our ship belied her tubbiness. A combination of the tide and the wind made her leap down river. There was a chance. Canute, secure your... I hesitated for the word. Ladies at the prow. Aye, the lady is grateful, Sven, for lately the guards had begun to cast covetous and lewd glances at them. They feared for their virtue. They were afraid of us until I took out my cross and swore that no harm would come to them. They believed me. I said, in Saxon, for the benefit of the three, and it is true, for I, Sven Saxon's sword, do not make war on women. I saw a smile and a nod from the youngest, Elfgifu. Turning to my men, I said, we are not out of this yet. Prepare bows, and then eat and drink. If those riders reach the Northumbrian ships, they will follow us, and if they are warships, then they will be rowed and faster. They will catch us. Eat while you can, and let us hope that we can lose them in the vastness of the sea. I went to stand with Edgar and took out the stopper of the ale skin. I drank deeply. Edgar's eyes never left Swain astride the prow as he spoke to me. If we can make the sea before they appear, then we can try to hide. It is like the game fox and geese. The foxes will not know where we have gone. If it is just one ship that follows, then we might well disappear, but two or more make it less likely. They can spread out, and all they need to do is seek a sail. If we were one of your drecker, we could take down the mast and simply row. We cannot do that, and even though we are unladen, we are still far from fast. Do the best you can, he smiled. Of course, and should we survive, then when I have children, this will be a tale to tell to make their eyes widen. The men had opened the barrels of salted herring. They had been put aboard for show, and none were anywhere near full. They ate, 
and an idea grew in my mind. I let it spin there while I went to partake in the feast. Faramir said, I owe you a life oath, sword. I shook my head. We fight for each other. The Norns spun and you slipped. I was handily placed and it was nothing. If we get out of this, then we will all be better warriors. Ulf asked, Do you think we will escape? I pointed to the northwest. The fired hall could be seen as a glow in the distance. All else was blackness. The Northumbrians may well seek us close to their hall, but we have to assume that they will not, and that they will sail their warships down the river Humber to retrieve their property. The people of this land have Danish blood, and may well have Drekka, or their own version of a Drekka. Whatever they have will be faster than this ship, but we can hope that we make the sea before dawn and disappear. We reached the Humber far quicker than on our journey up river and when we left the narrow waters of the hull I was relieved. However, it soon became clear that no matter how fast we were moving, we would not reach the sea in darkness. The black sky behind was contrasted with the slight glow ahead as the new day began to dawn. By the time Swain was no longer needed for the estuary was wide, it was daylight, and the empty sea beyond the shifting sands beckoned us. I joined Edgar. The wind is from the north and west. If we sail south and east, then we will travel faster, but it means that at some point, unless the wind changes, we will be forced to tack and sail more slowly to reach our home. And if we sail due east? Then we keep a steadier speed to Ayahona. I heard the caution in his voice. The Northumbrians do not know we came from there. They may think we are Norse. Aye, you may be right. When Jarl Sven Harkonnesson raided last year, he did us a favour. The Norns have already spun. Let us sail due east and hope that they either think we were Norse or that we are tricky Danes who try to throw them off the scent. The sun was rising in a chilly blue sky and we thought we had escaped when Harold, who along with Faramir was watching astern, spotted the sail. We turned to look. The exception was Edgar who stared ahead. Swain. Up to the top of the mast and see if you can identify it. It may be another trader. The son of Swain One Eye clambered to the top and sat astride the mast, his legs dangling over the yard. He stared, and when his words drifted down, it was like a crack of doom. It is a drecker, with shields along the side, and they have oars out. We could all see the sail which lay to the southwest of us. We had taken off our mail, for if it came to a fight with such overwhelming odds as we seemed likely to face, then it would only slow an inevitable end. Take your bows. Canute, you guard your ladies. It may not be them. He was still seeing everything as half full, and it was not. Shaking my head, I said, It is them, and the Norns have spun. As if to confirm it, as the pursuing ship drew a little closer, Swain shouted, There is a second one. It is further away and to the northwest. Edgar said, Aye. They have kept each other in sight, and with lookouts on their masts would have a better view of the sea. I can go no faster, and they will catch us. It is just a matter of time. I nodded. Unfasten the barrels of herrings. When they get close... I want the barrels hurled overboard. Who knows? They may be careless and hit one. That made the crew smile, and Gandalfa said, And that would be a great jest. In truth, it just gave them something to do and stopped them worrying about how they would die. Laris and Leif had been at Svolda, and they knew what happened in a sea battle. They would have told the younger warriors. The two ships began to converge, and we could see that they were smaller than a Threatonessa, but of a similar design. The nearer one, the ship we had first spotted, had a red sail, while the other had one which might have had a colour at one time, but it had faded to a dirty white. Neither had a dragon prow, but they had shields hanging along the side. I estimated there were thirty on each. That mattered little, for the two of them had enough men aboard to easily outnumber us. One advantage we had was that we all had bows. We could shower them with arrows, 
and it was unlikely that they would be able to respond in kind. We might take some of them, and a fouled oar from a dying man might well slow them down. Such are the thoughts of a drowning man who clings to any hope. I wanted to live and see my family, and I hoped that the Norns had not spun my death. When they are close enough, send arrows at them. We will wait until they are much closer before we use the barrels. Swain, come down and help us to move them. The ship was wider than a drecker, and that would help us. The six barrels were almost empty. They had just been to disguise our intent. They would float and bob about. They could be avoided, but in such a manoeuvre then the warship would lose way, and any carelessness might be rewarded with a sprung strake. When the barrels were ready, I saw that the two ships were almost within range of our bows, and that there was no one at the prow. The oars were biting and the ships were drawing closer, but their speed did not suggest that they were double crewed. Lars had a good arm, and he drew back his bow first to send an arrow soaring towards the nearest warship, the one we had seen first. It plunged into the wooden prow. It was the signal for the rest of my men to loose their arrows. Half of them managed to drop their missiles into the rowers. I knew that, for I saw one oar foul another. The ship slowed, and that allowed the other to close with us. After another shower at the first ship, Lars and my men switched to the other. The two ships were now closing rapidly, and our arrows were too few to hurt two warships. Swain, help me with the barrels. My plan was simple. We just used the weight of the almost empty barrel to tip it over the side. We had to use the larboard side for fear of fouling the steering board. The first barrel splashed and then bobbed towards the second warship. It was seen at the last moment and the ship veered to larboard as Swain and I dropped over the second barrel. The ship which had veered gave my archers a view of the steering board and they sent arrows towards it. The steersman steered a little further away as the arrows struck the boy next to him. The barrels now lay astern of us in a line and the two ships tried to avoid them. We heard the crack as the first ship, the one with the red sail, hit one a glancing blow. The effect was to drive it further from us. The barrels had done their job and the two warships now had to use a different approach. They would try to come alongside us, but that meant that one would reach us before the other for the dirty sail would have the wind and the red sail would be fighting it. We had bought time, but not much of it. Concentrate your arrows on the one which has the wind gauge. Leaf said, that means we will be loosing into the wind. It cannot be helped. Canute was peering over the prow and he shouted, I see a sail ahead. Could this be another of them? The trading ship was much shorter than a warship and his words were easily heard. Edgar shook his head. Unlikely. It'll probably be another trader. They will be wary until they recognise that we are a trader too. Might they intervene? He laughed. When they see two warships, they will head away as fast as the wind will carry them. The dirty sail was now closing with us. Some of the rowers had been taken from the oars and they held their shields over the steerboard so that we could not hurt the men there. Gandalf said, The other ship, the one with the red sail, is not closing as fast as the other. Edgar risked a glance. The barrel must have hurt her. With a sprung strike, she will take on water. There is hope. Dirty sail suddenly put their steerboard over to come directly for us. They were trying to drive us into the path of her consort. Edgar edged our steerboard over and our speed increased, but it meant we risked being rammed by the ship which had been damaged by the barrel. The white-sailed ship was going to hit us, that was clear, but if they wanted the girl back, then they would not try to sink us. Prepare your weapons, we need to stop them boarding. I turned to Edgar. Keep moving away from them and tempt them to hit the stern. At the last moment, put over the steering board and try to take out their oars. I thought I might have intimidated him, but he looked delighted. This is indeed a joke. The sheep becomes the wolf. I drew my two swords. Canute, can you make up the ship yet? Not yet, but it looks a large one. Canute was not one of the clan. We would have all known the type of ship and how many oars it had. 
I feared that this was a Norse pirate and we could end up being picked over by two enemies. My first priority was the white-sailed ship which was now barreling towards our larboard side. Edgar cleverly kept us parallel to them. The red-sailed ship was barely keeping pace with us, but once the other hit us we would have to stop and then we would be lost for we would be fighting two crews. Only Swain was still loosing arrows, and he gave a victory cry as his arrow slammed into the chest of the Saxon whirling the grappling hook. Another took his place, and I saw that we were just a ship's width away. The Saxon was going to lay alongside us. Now, Edgar! As he put it over, Canute shouted, I recognise the sail! It is Sea Serpent! The women of Eirhon had made the Sea Serpent on the sail, and Canute had recognised it. The clan was coming to our aid, and even as I began to believe we might live, I wondered how. There were cries as the oars on the side of the white-sailed ship were shattered, and some of the crew were impaled or stabbed with sharp shards and splinters of broken oars. I leapt up onto the gunwale and held onto the backstay with my left hand. Edgar's move had made some of the Saxons lose their footing while I had jumped on the side of the more stable trader. I swung Oathsword at the head of the nearest Saxon who lunged at me with a boarding pike. Leaving go of the stay, I used my other sword to deflect the head and Oathsword bit into the skull of the man. I saw that there were twenty or so men aboard, and many were still struggling to their feet or trying to stem the bleeding from wounds. I did something foolish, but at the time I thought it was necessary. I did a hawk and jumped down to the Northumbrian's deck. It took both crews by surprise and enabled me to swing both of my swords at head height. I hit men straight away, and then I ducked, dived, blocked, and stabbed. I knew that whatever flesh I hit would be an enemy's. My men shouted, Oath sword, and jumped down to join me. It was a mad thing to do, and left Raven's wing with just Canute, Edgar, and Swain to guard the women against the red-sailed ship which was looming up from steerboard. Then I heard a roar, and as I whirled to block an axe coming at my head while stabbing up into the throat of a Saxon, I saw the prow of Sea Serpent as our drecker smashed into the prow of the already damaged red-sailed Northumbrian ship. My men had the joy of battle in them, and even though when we had boarded we had been outnumbered, my berserk attack and their anger had slain every warrior who was still alive. I saw the helmsman and three of his crew hurl themselves from the stern. It reminded me of King Olaf Tryggvason, but the motives of the Northumbrians were less noble. They were trying to save their lives. I heard Lars shout, Or sword! The ship is sinking! We have yet to lose a man! Back! I nodded. Aye, the red mist has left me. I was the last to be pulled up by Canute, and the water was already lapping around my sealskin boots as I did so. Even as I stepped aboard, there was a gurgle of air and the ship slipped beneath the waves. Sea Serpent loomed over us, and Thorsten the Lucky leaned over, laughing. I think, Sven Saxon saw, that you must be the luckiest warrior I have ever met. I saw that the other ship was wreckage, and men were clinging to it and kicking as far away from us as they could get. Canute came and put his arm around my shoulder. No. Thorsten, the bravest and maybe the greatest warrior. Sven Saxon Sword, Oath Sword. The cry was taken up by both crews, and nodding, I kissed the hilt of Oath Sword. Epilogue We did not discover the whole story until we landed at Eyrhon. The decision to bring the Drekker to see if we needed help had not been the Jarl's. He was certain that we would survive. I was not sure about that. It was the clan who did not like the idea of Oath Sword, the weapon and me, being lost. After he had left us, Swain One-Eye said that no one gave a second thought to Canute. It was me and my warriors who were their concern. I was touched. They had been sailing towards the mouth of the estuary when they had seen our sail, and Thorsten told me that the ship had never travelled as fast. If we had wanted a sea trial to see her potential, we had it. Canute and the three Saxons stayed but three days. 
By that time his father had sent a wagon and an escort to take the maiden to a sanctuary. We learned that she would be housed in a nunnery close to Hedebir, and for that I was glad. There she would be looked after, protected, and safe. Knut's plans could wait. I had felt sorry for Elfgifu. She was no more than eleven or twelve summers, and yet she had been used and abused by those who did not care for her. I hoped that Knut would not be the same, but I did not know him as well as I thought I did. When he said farewell and clasped my arm like a warrior, I thought I had seen the last of him. We had raised him to be a warrior, and while he would never stand in our shield wall, he could lead armies from the rear and defend himself. The Norns were, however, still spinning. They had not done with me, and my threads were irrevocably bound up with Canute's. And although I did not know it then, I had made an enemy of Thurbrand the Hold. The End You've been listening to Oath Sword by Griff Hosker, narrated by Marston York. Published by Quest, an imprint of W.F. Howes Limited. This work is copyrighted 2021 Griff Hosker. This recording is copyrighted 2022 W.F. Howes Limited.